welcome to DAX Machina with your hosts, Naoma Finn, Steve Wildman Monrotis, and DA Roberts. Join us as we explore writing, books, authors, and all things horror. We will delve into the sightings, reports, encounters, and tales of monsters. We will also explore the writings of D.A. Roberts along with others in the horror genre. We will investigate the possibilities that monsters may not be safely locked away in the pages of books. They might just walk among us even now. Grab some popcorn and lock the doors. It's going to be a creepy journey. Welcome to D.A.X. Machina. <laughs> Good evening, folks, and welcome to DAX Machina. Uh, this is our Wednesday night edition. Uh, be, joining me is my partner in crime for Wednesday evenings, Naomi Finn. Steve can't join us on Wednesday nights. And we were having some technical difficulties up until just this very moment, when obviously from Naomi's reaction, she could finally hear me. Uh, we, now we can't hear you. <laughs> a glitch number one, folks. It wouldn't be a DAX mocking episode if we didn't have something wrong. Uh, apparently, her mic is not working now. Uh, but at least she can hear me, which is a, kind of a big improvement over the last 15 minutes. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the Beast of LBL again, only we're not going to be discussing the, the famous attack uh, that happened on the family of four back in the early 80s. We're going to be talking about attacks and accounts from around the LBL area, from inside the park itself, things that have happened over the last, well, hell, since it's been settled. Uh, accounts that have gone that go back more than a hundred years. It's uh, there's a lot more going on in that area than people realize, and even Naoma was dis- was surprised to discover that uh, there are some even down close to where she lives. Are, are you still having? Uh, can you can you can you talk? Can I hear you? I don't think you. There can. we go. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> hey <Hey-o! laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> it's a miracle. I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. Oh, my stars, Irene. I'm telling not you, Irene. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> what a crazy, crazy half hour this has been. Yeah, we've been beating our heads against the wall. <laughs> I have done everything I can. I have rebooted my computer. I've switched out microphones. I have unplugged and replugged my headphones. It was just crazy. <laughs> I, I think it was probably something on my end because you... You, only thing wrong was you just couldn't hear me. Yeah. So I I, I checked my mic settings and I don't know if I had a I had a cord loose or something, uh, but I just went over my microphone settings again and it started working. So <laughs> so oh. either that or with a show or the, the you know going live the show <laughs> made all the connections go magically. Yeah. yeah, I want to say thank you to everybody that's joining us tonight. Meg, I see you're back tonight. Thank you for being here. Marshall Sirota, thank you for being here. Alan J. Congdon, thank you for being here. Smedley Do-Right, hey, buddy, good to see you again. Irene Duet, thank you for being here. Lanita, how are you doing tonight? And uh, let's see if I miss anybody. Bill Sloan. Uh, oh, Patty, hey, Marshall. Patty, how are you hey, doing? Patty, did you get Marshall? Uh, uh, yeah, Marshall Sirota okay. got him. Uh, yeah. RJ, thank you for thank you for being here. And Owissa is back. Oh, Melissa Long, good night, everybody. And Gene Ellsworth says hi from one on Oniota, Alabama, Roll Tide. <laughs> oh, okay, got a, got a got a got a got a big football fan here. I'm so oh Illinois. Well, you see, I, I my mine is the uh, Rougarou, Rougarou, uh <laughs> expedition. So I'm sticking with cryptids. You can't go wrong with cryptids. Yeah, I should probably. Ivy Ray says hi. Well, thank you for joining us. <laughs> uh, well, now that actually everything is all the all of our equipment's finally <laughs> finally working, we can get going with the show. Um, I was really kind of astounded when I started digging in uh, to just the sheer number, and I and I dug into this before, uh, but did not really the depth that uh, that uh, Naomi and I have gone into it over the last few days. Um, well, I've literally found some accounts that said. Uh, Body, a body, a body found, uh, presumed animal attack. Nothing further. This is not a conspiracy. Don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to ask. Yes, we're asking. 
Yeah. Who says that? This is not a conspiracy, so don't ask. <laughs> We are not trying to fool you. No, oh, no, not at all. no, not at all. These that worked when I was three. <laughs> These aren't yep. the droids you're looking for. Right. <laughs> oh, Imperial so credits will do them. fine. <laughs> no, they won't. <laughs> Jedi mind tricks don't work on me. Only money. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you. Ah. Well, I found a couple of them like that. And I found one where the sheriff's department got into a big fight with the DNR over it, too. There was a huge pissing match in a couple of cases. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be fun to go through some of those tonight. Yes, it will. I am. Um, there's one that has intrigued me the most. And it was about uh, a, a pair of sisters. One was 16, one was 14. They went missing in 1980. Um, and they were, their bodies were found in the LBL. And one version of the story said animal attack. One said they'd been killed by a shotgun. Uh, and the person that had originally said animal attack was told to, told to recant the story and to, to stick with the official story that they gave to the family, which were never allowed to view the bodies. Yeah, he was told to recant his story or lose his job. But it's not a cryptid. No, but it's not a cryptid. And we're There's not never... trying to hide anything. You're just going to lose your job if you keep saying that. Although my personal favorite of all the animal attacks. Now this one just, it, it shouldn't have made me laugh, but it did. Uh, they keep, they have bison in the Southern half of LBL. And apparently some moron thought it was a good idea to try to pet one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with predictable results. He didn't die, but I think he did learn a very valuable lesson. Like the guy that put super glue on his hands and slapped the rhinoceros backside. He didn't die either, but man, did he yeah. swallow a lot of crap that day. <laughs> <laughs> Learned a very valuable life lesson right there, yeah. I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, since Forbes just said, given. Oh, go ahead. Oh, he's Landon Forbes says, Naomi, did you prove the story from Dixie Cryptid yesterday? Awesome story. You know what? That was all him, and that was probably the most awesome story I have ever heard. It was a great it's story. Been, yeah. It's been a long time since I got to actually hear a story from him that I hadn't done first. And so that was exciting in and of itself, but Oh my goodness. Anybody who has not heard that story. Don't go now. Stay with us. <laughs> when we're done, get over there and listen to it. It's Definitely. I can't remember the name of it right now. Can you DA? Uh, off the top of my head? No, I think it was something about a Bigfoot burial or Bigfoot grave. Yeah. Digging up a Bigfoot grave or something like that. He just mm -hmm. put it out yesterday and it is, Boy, you know, if he ever had any doubts about his writing skills, and that's not a, a, a fictional story. Hmm, excuse me. He went down and interviewed that man and, uh, and, and spoke to him face to face and got that story from that guy. And just boy. posted the link in the chat. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, Cause it is. I, I personally believe that's the finest story that's ever been on. True story that's ever been on on Dixie Cryptid. It's it's a damn good story. Yeah. Ivy Ray says, uh, read all the Lakeview Wild Hunt and now Apex Predator Blood Moon books. So great. Are these books on based on any truths? Uh, yes, yes and no. Uh, the stories are fiction, but I have spent years and years and years researching cryptids, and I used everything that I have learned to base the creatures or creatures' behaviors on. So the, the, the stories are fiction, but the behaviors are based on observation and, and, and on uh, uh, actual accounts. So there, there is some truth to the stories that just uh, the stories themselves are, are fictionalized accounts of, of that type of behaviors. Roger Peacock said that was an amazing story. Good. You're getting a lot of positive feedback on that story. Yeah. It's called The Bigfoot Grave Excavated in Mississippi. Thank you, sir. Yes, that's it. Bigfoot Bones is the title. What if it's true? Uh, oh, Matthew. I, he put it on both. Okay. Yeah, Matthew Grill says, I lo uh, love your books, dear. I read all your books. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, be watching because there'll be more coming very soon. Uh, S. Dresden says, great story. Um, Ivy races. What about the characters? A lot of the characters in the, in those books are based on real people. Um, to an extent, uh, they're, they're a fictionalized version. Uh, like the character of, of Daniel Clark. I based that off of a guy I've known for years. 
uh, who is, that's just his, his character to a fault. Uh, Will Gray Eagle is based off of a couple of people I knew, um, you know, kind of an amalgam of their personalities, but, you know, very much uh, uh, based off of living people. Um, and then some of the characters are actually direct transfers of people I've known. So uh, there is a lot of a lot of truth in those stories, even if it is a fictional a fictional account. And they're based in real locations. Real oh, yes. Towns, all the locations real... are there. Yeah. All those places are there. Most of the restaurants, the only restaurant that doesn't actually exist is Steve's Pub and Grub. But one day we may actually build that. <laughs> um, but uh, all the restaurants I described where they go to eat and everything, those are all there. I, I, I base a lot of these off of my own travels throughout the Ozarks. I'm an Ozarks hillbilly born and bred. And I, I wanted to bring stories to the places where I've deer hunted and fished and hung around and traveled throughout my youth and, and beyond. And, and I just wanted to bring that love of the Ozarks folklore to those books. And I noticed um, on the prelude that that Cam put up yesterday uh, for Lakeview Man Two, mm -hmm. uh, how many people were were able to put themselves right into the scene because they'd been to Silver Dollar City. That was That's, pretty. Cool. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew Gruel says, "I used to li I used to live in Missouri and around the area where your writing takes place. Well, then, then you know you know what I mean. I, the Ozarks kind of has a way of getting into your blood." Uh, I'm an, I'm just an Ozarks kid, and uh, no matter where this life takes me, my heart will always be in the Ozarks. Uh, Northwood says, this week my working schedule has put a halt to any reading or writing. That's unfortunate. I'm sorry, man. I hate hate to hear that. Um, Darn Chris, right. It gets in the way all the time. I'm, I'm not even going to try to pronounce your last name, sir. I will butcher it. So I'll, I'll just say Chris. Uh, Cam changed it up for that story and achieved a force multiplier in the impact with that change. Yeah, Cam is awesome. Yeah, he does a fantastic job on the on the on those stories, and Naomi does too. She is fantastic. She's done some of my stories, and I just I, 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 I even go back and listen to them more than once because I just I when she narrates it, I forget that I wrote it. I mean, <laughs> I I just sit back and enjoy the story. Uh, what's this is a story last night was about a shark to shark tooth critter. They are called either fish people or ganganar. Not a Bigfoot. They kill Bigfoot and will do the same to us. Weird. Never even heard of those. I will have to try, yeah. try to look those up. Uh, Werewolf says the restaurant. I, the restaurant I wanted to be real. Steve's Pub and Grub. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that's the one that's not real. However, if you ever find yourself down in the area of um, um, what's that little town? Uh, Rockaway Beach, Missouri. Uh, I mentioned in the fourth book of the Apex Predator series. There's a little little restaurant there called the Pizza Cellar. Some of the best homemade pizza I've had anywhere. I mean, it's not like your your Domino's or anything like that. It's not your cardboard cutter, cookie cutter pizza. It's it's made by hand, and all the ingredients are are, are fresh, and it's it's some damn good pizza. It it's so it's worth the drive down there for me. Uh, uh Jeffsky. Sorjevsky, okay. Uh, sure. Zach uh, Zach Zierin, Ziernik says we need audiobooks of all yours all yours DA. I don't have time to read, but I can listen at work all day. Well, we're in the process of doing that. I've got narrators working on the Lakeview Man. Uh, no, I've got Naomi working on the Lakeview Man series. Cam's doing the the Codename Wild Hunt series, and we'll most likely I'll be doing the um, uh, Nightmare Hunter series as well. If I haven't talked to him about that, but I want to. Um, I've got a person on the Ragnarok Rising series and a person that's doing the Apex Predator series. So hopefully, you know, schedule permitting, we'll start seeing some of those books coming out very soon. Yeah, I've got to record a little bit uh, for What If It's True Tomorrow. And uh, my older son just had a baby. Well, actually, his wife did. I'd like to see him have a baby. Um <laughs> And uh, I'm going to go up Friday and make chicken and noodles for her because that's her favorite thing. And she awesome. break. And then Saturday I come back to record, finish recording. So hopefully I will have that book done in the next week or so. <laughs> I think that's cute. Irish, <laughs> don't you know? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> hey, it'd be no different than the Gaelic spelling of some things. Hey, uh, yeah. I've been been uh, been learn, trying to learn Gaelic, and sometimes you'll look at a word and go, "That surely isn't pronounced." <laughs> like the this time of year, of course, a lot of people bring up Samhain, 
And mm -hmm. I always laugh because so many people still say Sam Hain because that's the way it's spelled. Yep. And I have Keeping never Josh. been able to to come up with that one. I don't know why they call it Samhain when it clearly is spelled Sam Hain. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Irish have pronounced everything so differently. Yeah. Um, like uh, the word, well, I will, I will type it out in the chat room. And there's a little accent mark above the A I can't really do quickly on my key keyboard. Okay. But uh, S-L-A-I-N-T-E. How, how do you think that would be pronounced? Uh, well, let me see. Irish way. Sl <laughs> I don't know. Slunja. Slunja. Okay. It's like cheers. So, Slunja. Cool. Slunja. Well, as long as we're playing this game, there's a little town not far from me. And how would he, how, how would you spell that? Or how would you pronounce that? Uh, Gamaliel? It's Gamalia. Gamalia? <laughs> oh, yeah, I totally I get know. that. Yeah. It's like <laughs> Miami, Oklahoma. But, but it's spelled Miami, but they all pronounce it Miami and get mad if you don't call it Miami. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ivy Races, uh, I hope Cam writes a Steve Lilly book. It'll be a great loss if he doesn't. Actually, supposedly he's working on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't wait for that. I love Steve Lilly. Uh, I, I was I'm stunned that my uh, my little contribution to the Steve Lilly universe has over seventy thousand views now, which just astounds me. Uh, I, I'm I, I'm like super stoked about that, um, and uh, seventy eight thousand views now. Holy moly! Wow. Uh, and yeah, you know, that that Cam and Cam's narration of that is awesome. Well, I've got a se a sequel to that in the works, where the Wild Hunt and Cam uh, will meet up again. So hopefully, I'll I'll get that done before too terribly long, and then it'll just be a matter of time for them to be able to get it narrated and out there. Yeah. Uh, Zach says, "Awesome, thanks. I really enjoy them. I've listened to the two you have out. Thanks, I appreciate that." Uh, Josh says winter project. He said, didn't he? Uh, he was last time I talked to Cam, he was going to try to have, uh, the, the, uh, codename wild hunt books recorded and uploaded hopefully by sometime in early October. I think, uh, I think he got sidetracked today and tomorrow by the day job, but I mm. do think that that's his, one of his priorities is that. And he and I are talking about putting out a book of short collected short stories together. So he's also that would be that. awesome. Yeah. He and I've got a lot <laughs> our plates. <laughs> he's got a lot more than I do, but <laughs> uh, well, it'll be fun. Well, Cam's a much better writer than he gives himself credit. He really is. I mean, and I think that story yesterday is very much proof of that. I I I thought to myself, why does he think he needs me? <laughs> that was off the charts amazing. But oh, that's so nice. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That's a uh, I love that comment. Thank it's you, really, Mr. Esden. And I, I would like to add to that that I am not uh, the kind of person who makes friends easily. I'm just not people oriented, and I never have been. But in the last year, I have met two of the best friends of my life. <laughs> Three, if you count Cam's wife, April. <laughs> I have and not I've met never her met Annette. Oh gosh. I, I think you her. get along fine with Annette. I think you, you two are so, very similar. Oh, I'm I'm hoping so. But it's just been really strange. And and we just seemed all three of us to have clicked so well together that when we're in the room together, or you know, virtual room, because we've never actually been in the room together, uh, it's just like sitting down with someone you've known your whole life. Well, that's awesome. I can't wait for the three of us to be able to sit and sit and uh, have a cup of coffee and you know sit around and, and, and just talk. Yeah. I think that's going to be too. awesome. Looking forward to that very soon, you, hopefully. You and me both. <laughs> so <sighs> enough padding on our backs. <laughs> oh, thank you for the... <laughs> I'm yeah, smart enough to know to, that when I go anywhere, I'm going to stick with Annette because she knows how to use a gun and she's smart enough not to get out of the car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's a wicked good shot and she stays in the car. So if I get it over yeah. my head, I know I'll be ha having a search party coming eventually because <laughs> she'll be peeling out. <laughs> and she's going to be 
have uh, someone in shotgun with her too, because it'll be me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you guys for the congratulations. She's a doll. Her name's Tegan. Tegan. That's a cool name. Mm -hmm. I like that name. Yeah. I wanted Luna Sage, but no. Luna Tegan. Sage. That's kind of pretty too. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're like, but they'll call her Looney. <laughs> yeah. Well, her grandmother is. So it works out. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. They, I like Tegan too. I, it's, it's, I believe it's Celtic, but I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up, but it sounds Celtic. Yeah. So anyway, uh, about tonight's show, mm -hmm. do you want to tell us a story? Why don't you start ladies first? Cause I know you found some really good ones. <laughs> well, you know what? Let's do the ones that people have heard so we can kind of get them out of the way. Okay. Um, I'm sure that everybody knows about the Murray State College students uh, in 1974 and their VW van or microbus. And um, if not, this is a good I'll, one. Yeah, I will I share like this one. with you. I think there were about four of them. It was spring break. They decided to head off to the LBL, and there, there's no death in this one. We'll get to that soon. Uh, but they they decided to head off to the LBL and just kind of chill out for the week. And um, as the day progressed, one of them had to answer nature's call. And while he was in the woods, he didn't feel all that comfortable. When he came back, he said, you know, I felt like something was watching me while I was out there. And I heard some breathing and uh, it just didn't seem right. And his friends were like, ah, yeah, it's probably just a deer or something. You, you're, you're overreacting. So he brushed it off as his friend suggested. And as the night went on and they sat around their little fire outside their little microbus, they began to hear footsteps around them, all around their little campsite. And then they began to hear howling. And if that wasn't weirding them out enough, they started seeing red glowing eyes in the bushes around them. At that point, they used their college intelligence, got in their microbus and took off. But that wasn't the end of it. As they were driving down the road, they caught something in their rear view mirror chasing them. And it actually got a hold of the, of the microbus and left four long claw, claw marks down the back of it. Which they discovered when they got back to school because like good boys, they didn't stop till they got there. <laughs> and I just find that one interesting because it... It just, it proves that this goes back way beyond 1982. Uh, and actually it goes even way, way farther back than that. Um, it's Celtic for strong and graceful. Tegan is. Awesome. Um, but um, yeah, it, it, and, and I just wanted to throw that in because I want people to really understand that this isn't a legend that started with a family in an RV. No, this has been it's, around since long before it was land between the lakes. It's gone. It gone. It goes back to the Native Americans who talked about uh, upright canines that would that would stalk people. How that area was it was dangerous and cursed, and they encouraged people not to go there. And there are f uh, accounts from French trappers of what they called, as my shirt says, the Rougarou or the or the Loop Guru. Um, that would that that would uh, stalk them in the deep woods near near the land between the rivers, and many cases where trappers just didn't come back. Uh, so the, this goes way back, way beyond uh, the account that happened in '82. And I can tell you from experience from being in LBL, uh, the people that live right across the, the 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 canal in Grand Rivers act like they have never heard of it. They've never heard of the legend. They don't want it. But that's a tourist town, and it relies 100 percent on the tourists go 10 miles down the road to Paducah and everybody's, oh, oh yeah, I've got a story about happening to me down there. Everybody wants to talk about it. They all know about it and they all had, they've all had some sort of experience. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of accounts from fishermen who have been fishing just right at dusk or right at the break of day, early morning. And they would go back in some of those little sloughs and coves and something would come out and snarl at them. They'd fire up the motor and get the hell out of there. Oh, uh, 
appears to be actually more accounts from fishermen seeing it from the boat than from people who traipsing around through the woods. Because if you're if you're running with a trolling motor and you're out in the water, you're making a lot less noise than tra- than you are traipsing down a trail. So I can completely see why why fishermen are seeing it at a much higher rate. By the way, um, speaking of the bison, there they have a lot of calves coming up missing in those mm-hmm. in that herd. Same with the elk herds. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that? I'm with the beast. I kind of what? Uh, well, so I'm with the beast. I kind of feel the same way about hippies. <laughs> uh, RJ says, when you're getting surrounded and nervous, do what I do. I fire several hundred rounds all around me in 360 degrees. Using two guns spinning in a circle, fire fire high and low. You'll feel safe. No one around you will, but you will. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully everybody, everybody listens when you yell, get down. <laughs> Marcia uh, laugh, uh, laughing at werewolf. Uh, <laughs> they get pissed when I do it in Albertson's frozen food <laughs> section, but it's effective. <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. But, I, mean, uh, just, I know you don't go in the woods after dark between Eskimos of Michigan and, and Wisconsin and state line. There's a lot of places I hear you don't go in the woods after dark. Uh, there's a lot of stories coming out of Taylor, Mississippi, where there are certain roads you don't drive down after dark. I cannot yes. wait to go down there. And, of course, I'll be <laughs> driving those roads. You better swing a little bit west and, or east and pick me up. Oh, you know I will. Somebody's going <laughs> to run the back camera. <laughs> Uh, Just remember, that's the only thing I can run. I can't run off my feet. You're going to have to keep that car going. (laughs) You you trust me. If anything gets in the road, I will be carrying enough firepower to hold off a small army. Cool. Assuming I don't just run over it. I will leave you dead in the road. (laughs) Sorry. Oh, it's good to know. (laughs) I am not the ideal backup. (laughs) Cryptoville says evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And... Northwood Cryptids is those Uper Cryptids in CNA. <laughs> they growl, don't you know? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Zach says, there's an 18th century historical account of a loop guru in or around Quebec City. There's a lot of loop guru accounts, especially from those French trappers. Um, I Can I ask a question? Shoot. I I hear people use both loop guru and guru guru, and I assume that the words are interchangeable. But I listened to a the, podcast one time that says they're, they're really very not. different. Yes. Okay. Uh, a, the loop guru is very much the French version of the werewolf, or even can be applied to a dog man. The mm-hmm. rougarou, on the other hand, is a French Cajun term, generally applying somebody that was turned either by voodoo or hoodoo. I see. So they're very different, and um. The, in some ways, the 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 Ruguru is report, reputedly harder to kill. Wow, interesting. Um, Matthew you know, Garul, if you go to if you go to Taylor anytime soon, I would love to see some pictures, man. If you have any experiences or see anything wicked cool, give us a holler here on the show. I will put up the email address real fast. Uh, that is da roberts at da roberts.net, and we would love to have you on the show to talk about your experiences down there. That would be that would be awesome. Josh has put you on the tail gun. <laughs> <laughs> no, just put me on opiates. I don't want to know what's happening. <laughs> Sal says, good evening, everyone. Sorry to be late. My dog was alerting me to something in the yard, went out with a gun and a flashlight, didn't find anything, no eye shine, LOL. Well, that's that's unfortunate. It would be great if you get some footage of that. But yeah. oh, I'm glad there's nothing uh, nothing in your yard. Uh, Josh says, DA run over, hard to run over in a minivan. You'd be surprised at the clearance that little booger has. <laughs> a Dodge minivan's got some pretty good clearance. Uh, let's see. Estrezen says, are you familiar with the story of Thies of Kaltenbrunn? No, I do not know that story. I would love to hear it, though. If you got a link to it or you would like to, like to tell me the story, I'd love to set up a time to chat about it. I'd love to hear it. Matthew says, you'll be the first, I promise. Oops. I didn't mean to to click on the night bot, but the night bot's got a point. If you're enjoying the show, please like, and subscribe, hit that bell for notifications of when we go live. And, uh, you know, th- that support for the channel would be awesome because our numbers are growing 
and uh, you know, with, almost with every show, we're we're picking up we're picking up new subscribers, and uh, I'm I'm really happy to be having more and more people join us as we we thoroughly enjoy doing this, and it's 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 such a great time for us to be able to hang out with you guys and talk about cryptids and talk about books and laugh at at, at dumb jokes and and talk about Naoma shooting me accidentally when when we're <laughs> running from <laughs> running from a rougarou. Yeah, accidentally. Yeah, accidentally. <laughs> Uh, Ivy says, Ivy Ray says, my favorite TV show is Terror in the Woods on the Travel Channel about people scripted encounters. I've been watching that show. That is a good show. I've watched a bunch of them. Uh, Monsters and Mysteries in America has got some good episodes. Uh, there's some really good shows out there. I I would love to be able to uh, get uh, the attention. And if anybody out there knows anybody at the Travel Channel, send them my direction. But I would like to put a show together, get Naoma and, and Cam and a few other uh, of us and go to some of these locations and film film for a show i think it'd be a hoot and a half to get the, the, our different perspectives on this show on, on a show in these locations uh you know me from me from law enforcement standpoint uh cam because he's been so been, been in, in the in the field for so long naoma t- t- has, t- has a whole different approach than either of us so i think the three of us going to these places and checking them out would be awesome no naoma to laugh at you no <laughs> make, fun of, <laughs> make fun of us <laughs> Point the gun in the wrong direction. <laughs> what is the thing they put on their shoulder and point it uh, wrong? Oh, the, uh, the, uh, it's uh, some sort of camera. GoPro. No, I was talking about a big long lance thing that, uh, oh. the, help me out, Papa Bear. The selfie stick? It, no, it shoots weapons. It's a weapon. Big long. Oh. Uh, it's javelin. Oh, a javelin. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Northwood said, dog I had a long time ago would bark at anything that moved, even trees moving in the wind. That sounds like my idiot dog, Harley. Great dog, but uh, yeah, he barks at literally everything. Uh, Lenny says, just like Cam's story, my Sasquatch will go invisible and you can see through them. I think I sent you a picture of that DA. Yeah, I think you did. Um, let's see. Uh, I get tickled watching mountain monsters. That that show has got to be taken just with a, with a huge grain of salt, like about the size of Mount Rushmore, because there's you just can't take that show seriously. It it, it is clearly meant for entertainment value. You know, um, Sal Paso says Terror in the Woods, great show. Sorry, Anna, I'm gonna go ahead. No, that's okay. I was watching uh, a, a interview with uh, Tim Kumbo Baker, and he was talking about a guy who had seen um two bigfoot fighting in an open uh um uh, clearing field? where they had it w- well it was where they cut the trees there's a word for that oh um i uh, right away where they a cut for cut, the uh a, a cut back a cut i don't know my mind like, like a fire break or it, uh, well they were logging it was oh, okay. a logging field and they suddenly realized that they were out in the open and uh and then they realized this guy was 200 yards away watching him and they walked towards the briars which you know once things have been cut and they start to grow back it's just it's impossible to penetrate and he watched them dissolve right in front of him and i thought that was really and and walked into those briars without you know like in uh, Jurassic Park, when you can see the velociraptors running and they're making a trail. Yeah, there was no trail, but they didn't leave a trail behind us. They walked through it. And I found that was interesting because he's not, uh, you know, he's not a supporter of the whole we- woo theory. But, yeah, you know, that's he, uh, that's an interesting account. Yeah. Like I said, uh, I, I make no claims about being an expert on any subject, especially cryptids. And I will not dispute anybody's account of anything and what they call the woo or anything like that, because we don't know anybody, anybody could be right. Um, I tend to approach things uh, from my, my training as law enforcement. I tend to approach things from the physical evidence aspect, what I can, what I can observe, what I can touch. And until I have an encounter where something like that happens, I'm, I'm sticking to the the physical evidence side that it's a physical being. But uh, again, I am not saying I'm right. I'm saying that's the path I pursue. Uh, And I keep an open mind to any other possibilities because we just simply don't know. 
Uh, Josh has a good point. Says, you know, a good way to get that picked up is just start doing it on YouTube. That's kind of what I've been trying to do with the LBL trips and stuff. And also when I, when I go to the Hellgate up in, uh, up in uh, Stull. Kansas, in Stull, Kansas in a couple weeks. Uh, Irene says, my family in Upper Michigan are really looking forward to getting your channel when they finally get a tower that does the job. Well, thank you. I hope they, I hope they can tune in and like it. <laughs> Uh, Zach says, would that imply a Ruguru is demonic? Uh, I don't know if it's necessarily would call it demonic, but certainly supernatural in the respect that uh, yeah, it, uh, it's re in relation to, to the voodoo religion or the, or the hoodoo. Um, and uh, uh, I was once told by a fellow that used to live down there that, uh, that uh, the way to keep the Ruguru at bay was you put 13 pennies on your porch because apparently large numbers confuse them and they'll bypass your porch uh, because they apparently can't count above 10 or 12. Um, again, that's just, you know, one of the superstitions. Um, and another thing that, that you could wear a gree gree bag, a grease grease bag. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. G R I S G R I S. Gree gree. I think it is. Uh, it's kind of like a medicine pouch that Native Americans make, but uh, the hoodoo will, the hoodoo practitioners will make a gree gree bag for you to keep away evil spirits, and that can keep away the rougarou as well. Uh, but I know if I lived down in that swamp, I wouldn't be taking no chances. Yeah. See, that whole first part of that statement. You know, if mm -hmm. I lived. Yeah, if Not I live down there. Yeah. I don't particularly want to live down there. But you know what? I would love to go down there into the swamps and take one of those late night swamp tours. I, oh, I would so love to do that. Uh, Annette, of course, will be, you know, you know, watching my Facebook live from the comfort come of the hotel. <laughs> I'll, I'll sit there and drink with her while you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, boy, you should be saying, saying stuff like, boy, I'm glad I'm not out there with all those mosquitoes. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we can all go down and Annette and I will spend the evening uh, exploring the French Quarter. <laughs> you can go out and do what you got to do. <laughs> I can totally see that. I, yeah, I can completely see that. Well, kind of like the old mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. While Jim, Jim wrestles the bull rhinoceros, I'm going to slip into a tent with a native girl and a pitcher of Mai Tais. Yeah, thanks a lot there, Marlon Perkins. <laughs> Just call me Marlin. There you go. Alyssa says, "Da, did you ever hear about Saint Christopher? He was a he was dog, dog headed." Yes, I have read about that. I actually got a Saint Christopher's medallion around here too, somewhere. Uh, it was a gift from a friend. I also have a uh, Saint Michael's medallion uh, that was given. In fact, that's right here. Um, if you look at the front of it, I don't know how well you can see it. It's got the Saint Michael on it, and on the back it has the emblem of my old sheriff's department. Uh, the sheriff gave us these one year for Christmas, and mine's kind of, kind of dirty looking because I wore it underneath my body armor for about ten years. <laughs> uh, but yes, I have heard about Saint Christopher. That's a pretty interesting story. Story. Uh, Neil must say, "Well, fellas, it sounds like it's time to go." <laughs> yep. <laughs> Cryptoville says a clear cut. That's it. Thank you. I knew it had cut in it somewhere. A clear cut. Exactly. That's what they were fighting in when he saw them. <laughs> well, it says the disappearing trick is something they all do. Uh, yeah, Matthew says a slash back. A slash is what they call the branches they take off of the of the the of the the trees that they're going to use for for lumber. Uh, but slash piles are everywhere. Sometimes they burn them off. Sometimes they leave them. We used to welcome finding those slash piles because we always knew we could kick rabbits up out of them. And uh, yeah, when I used to go rabbit hunting when I was a young man, when you, you saw a slash pile, it was Christmas Day for rabbits. <laughs> All you had to do is throw a rock in there and let the dog run in after the rock because my dog was a lunkhead and he'd chase anything you threw. And when he went into that brush pile, rabbits were coming out in 12 directions. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I agree. Most shows about cryptids are just for entertainment. Yeah, I agree. They they because if you're to... marching around out there with a camera crew making bellering noises and beating on trees, you're not going to see anything because no. your camera crew alone is going to keep them at bay. You're not exactly being quiet. They need to rethink some of the names of them, but I think we've all renamed the Finding Bigfoot one for them. Irene says Saint uh, Saint Christopher was the patron <laughs> saint of travelers. Um, trying to keep up with the, 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 uh, the, yeah. okay, and the, uh, comments as much as I can. So I mean, it was also a dog faced hybrid. Um, uh, 
already I've already dealt with demonic, but fortunately I was able to divorce her. <laughs> That's exactly uh, what my ex-husband says. <laughs> uh, Josh says uh, demonic is a colloquial religious term. I believe in demons, but not in that sense, but more in the sense of just evil manifestations of energy or beings in that way they could be. I, I suppose so, because 80% of the accounts that I've read of Dogman, and not just in the LBL, just 80% of the time when somebody has actually seen one, they usually either use the word demonic or hellish or and or the phrase pure evil. And they, they just, they don't appear, they don't appear like they're there to, you know, go, would you like to buy some Girl Scout cookies? They're, <laughs> they're, they're not there to be your buddy. They're predators, pure and I'm simple. A sparkly. Yeah. <laughs> I have 10 men. Of course, that would, it's probably how they'd get me. Like, do you have the yeah. little, car, do you have the little caramel ones? All right, I'll go mm -hmm. with you. Okay, yeah. let's go get, let's go get them. They're in the, they're in the, in the woods over here. Just come with me. <laughs> okay, I got my checkbook. <laughs> What do you I mean was I never seen to, again. <laughs> what do you mean I have to cover myself in barbecue sauce to get into the woods? <laughs> it's flea repellent. <laughs> Keeps away the mosquitoes. <laughs> Just slather it on thick. We like it that way. <laughs> well, you missed the spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> how did we how did we devolve from talking about dog man to wearing <laughs> wearing <laughs> Barbecue oh, guys, sauce? I don't barbecue know. Sauce. I think I just found a new type of barbecue sauce. Speaking of barbecue sauce, she's oh. trying to bound and determine to make me eat healthy. Uh, <laughs> she she found some that's sugar free, but it's supposed to be really really good. So I'm probably going to try that tonight or tomorrow. I'm going to make little smokies with it and see if it's going to any any good. Hmm. Yeah, let me know because I think okay. that sugar's like the base ingredient. Of yeah, brown sugar. Sauce. Yeah. And if I don't like it, I'll just add some brown sugar. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Zex is demonic evil. evil. <laughs> yeah, got a couple of cups of brown sugar just to really taste, yeah. just to flavor it up. <laughs> Breakfast across the threshold is supposed to repel, repel evil. Really? Huh. That's a new. I one. know that there's a lot of things to deal with threshold and and mm -hmm. opening gates. Mm -hmm. uh, they say Robert Johnson had made his deal with the devil at a crossroad mm -hmm. um and there's certain times of day between daylight and dark there's certain you know thresholds are abounding and always seem to open unwelcome doors that's why for years they they put uh fences around cemeteries it wasn't about keeping anything out it was creating a threshold and now and if i drive by and i see a cemetery with or a graveyard without a fence around it i'm like <laughs> oh, <laughs> dad's and we were looking at a house and i looked down the road it was like a block down the road and there was a small chapel with a cemetery with no fence around it i'm like nope not living here <laughs> <laughs> ain't doing it my family cemetery in arkansas does not have a fence but it does have a, a, a pasture full of cows so i'm sure they keep things in just fine So dog man like Girl Scout cookies and Bigfoot like Krispy Kreme donuts. Got it. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're clear well, that's on that the trick. Well, this uh, is Sweet Baby Ray's. <laughs> yeah, I love Sweet Baby Ray's. That's my favorite. Mine too. Uh, what this is? I just watched a primatologist who is record who using recorded Bigfoot calls. I left at her choice of calls. Yeah, you never know. I mean, when you go out there, you know, making making Bigfoot noises, how do you know you're not like? Throwing out a mating call. Do you have a plan for that? Do you have a plan for an eleven foot Sasquatch with a, uh, a, a amorous with, and... with amorous intent that comes running out of the woods, wanting to take you to the Bigfoot prom? Yeah. Because he I shows... don't, I don't have a plan for that. He shows up with a bouquet of, of roses and a lascivious smile. You might be in trouble. <laughs> I'm just going to try to look uglier than Josh when that happens. <laughs> Bigfoot, take the pretty one. Oh, Josh, you are in so much trouble. <laughs> Anita says it takes a lot to scare me. Tell me something. Okay, well, some of these accounts that we're about to get into are pretty, are pretty creepy. Um, Primal Kitchen. I've got another stale one. Sauces. I can tell you. Um, back in about 1998, there was. Uh, uh, I don't know if it was one or two bow hunters in the LBL, but 
Uh, they'd gone out early. As you know, anybody who, who hunts knows that means does not mean they're going to come in early. Uh, the wife went to bed, having not heard from her husband yet. She assumed that he was probably uh, had gotten a deer that day. And when she woke up the next morning, he still wasn't home. And that's when she panicked and she um, called the police and she went looking for him and they went looking for him and they found him about 65 feet up in a tree. His body had been bent to pieces and torn apart. And they, they said, this was a dog attack, big dog, <laughs> big tree. <laughs> yeah. What was it? Clifford, the big red dog. Good no, God. I'm only kidding about that, but they did. They found him. And then at that very, around that same time, uh, there were a group of people who were out and the man had just gotten a gun and he wanted to set it in before he went out hunting. So he went over to, uh, I believe there's a quarry around there somewhere and he was setting it in and um, they, he didn't show up and he didn't show up and they finally went looking for him. And when they found him, they found him in his truck. His body had bent so that his knees were touching the back of his head. He was crammed into his truck. The, his brand new gun that he was setting in, the barrel had been bent, completely bent. And they found foot footprints. They think that what he had done was he had attracted them. He saw them, went looking for them, uh, when they realized he was chasing him, they said, well, we can do this better than you. And they chased him and uh, they refused to follow the tracks, which I think was probably a smart thing. Cause I wouldn't do it. Probably. I'd be like, best. look, he's dead. I don't need to know why. Yeah, well, you, don't, yeah. you don't necessarily but, fold people up and stuff them in behind the, behind the wheel of their car like that. But that was one of those cases. And, and you'll hear this a lot tonight. I think at least one more time that I know of, where the body was put into a sealed casket and the family was not allowed to have an open casket funeral. Northwoods cryptids got a point. It seems many, many cryptid attacks are labeled as bear attacks. Bear attacks are dog attacks. A lot mm -hmm. of the LBL, uh, ones in the LBL area, especially on animals, there's a lot of attacks on animals that they always say it was a pack of wild dogs, but they never capture the pack of wild dogs or ever find it. I want to ask you this, if you saw this, if or if you noticed this, Oh, excuse me. I shouldn't have drank pop tonight. Um, <laughs> this is why I don't drink beer. Anyway, um, or soda. I'm sorry. I'm from the Midwest. We call it pop, but I know it's soda down here or Coke. But anyway. Um, I've got cousins that call it soda pop. Soda pop, yeah. <laughs> That's middle southwestern Iowa. I swear it is. But anyway, uh, every time I would go to look up a person when I would find somebody with a mysterious death or whatever, um, one of those, this is not a cover up. Don't ask every single time I would try to Google it about the second or third one down would be, uh, big cats are now officially, um, spotted in Tennessee or in Kentucky or, and I would think there is nothing in my search, not one thing in my search that says cougar or big cat or, but every single time I went to search something. I would bring those up and I'm thinking, are they trying to put in some little, a little slip subliminal? Yeah, I saw the same thing. I, I did put nothing in about big cats and yeah. a lot of those attacks, like the ones they tested on the, those miniature horses came back mm -hmm. as unknown canine. Yeah. Not cat, not feline canine. And the prints they found around the body were big canine tracks, not mm -hmm. big cat tracks. That's right. But, by the way, those horses were killed by knives and guns, according to the DNR. Yeah, even though they were bite marks and slash marks. <laughs> I, I, I've, got a, I've got a biter gun just stashed in the back. It leaves big old bite marks every time you shoot it. <laughs> About this big around? <laughs> yeah, huge bite marks. Great big bite radius. Um, one of my personal favorites, and I've talked about this one before, but I, when I was doing my when, when I was doing some digging, when uh, when uh, Naomi and I decided what the topic of this show was going to be, I dug back into this one uh, because um, if you listen to Nick Valente from the North American Dogman Project, he heard a very different version of the story that I heard. Uh, there was a guy who lived just outside LBL across the lake. 
he lived on on the on the Kentucky uh, Kentucky Lakeside. Um, he had a dog, and in, this is where Nick and I defer. Uh, Nick heard it was a very small dog. I heard it was a German Shepherd. So I started digging, and I found both versions floating around out there. Yet the consistent thing was is what happened next. The guy w- went to bed, and his dog started acting weird. Uh, it was like whining and trying to get in bed with him, trying to get under the bed. And so he's like, "That's that's odd behavior. This dog doesn't do that." He gets out of bed, grabs his shotgun, and heads downstairs. Well, in his kitchen, he had a doggy door for the dog to go in and out whenever it wanted to to go to the bathroom, which is a bad thing to do if you live in the country because it's a great way to wake up wake up with possums or skunks in your kitchen. But he had a dog door for the for this dog, and like I said, the version I heard was a German Shepherd. And when he got to his kitchen and flipped on the light, there was a dog man that had one arm and his head through the door, trying to get through the door, trying to get into the house. And it and, was uh, not going. Pee pie. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't bringing. Wasn't bringing Girl Scout cookies. I can tell you, it, it had clawed up the floor and on the wall and was trying to pull itself the rest of the way through. And when he raised the shotgun to fire, it popped back out like a cork. And uh, he uh, ended up opening the door and shooting at it a couple times as it ran for the woods. Um, but that's a to me that's just one of the most frightening stories um because it almost got in the house and had the dog not woke him up and it got the rest of the way in we would probably had another one of those accounts where police arrived and there was blood all over the place in the house and the dog was dead and you know that one just to me it's just frightening because i thought it was a small german shepherd a very small small german shepherd (laughs) i uh you know, I love going out in the woods and looking for creepy stuff. And I like, go, I love, I enjoy, had a great time going to LBL and filming stuff, but that's there. I, I don't want it at my house. I don't want, I like when I was going out in the backyard and I haven't seen it all at all, all that are this week, but when I was going out and seeing eye shine at the back fence, you know, it bothered me more than it had, had it, had I seen eye shine in the woods. Because, well, one, if I was out in the woods, I'd have been armed, which I was anyway, because even I'm, I'm armed in town. Um, but it was at my house. And to me, that makes it makes, a, makes any story infinitely more creepy. You know, when a camper comes across something creepy out in the woods, that's one thing. When it's trying to get in your house or when you go to the kitchen to get a glass of milk and something's trying to turn the doorknob, that's terror to me. Yeah, Absolutely. What was the name of um, Brenton Sawin? Do you remember his show? Brenton Sawin, yeah. Uh, his YouTube show? Yeah, uh, I used to listen to that show. He passed away just a couple of years ago, didn't he? Yeah, and they have since taken down his YouTube shows, which breaks my heart. I cannot remember the name of his, his show, but it was, a, it was a good show. I listened. To, I, I loved his narration style. Do you remember the story, um, the uh, Moonshiners? stories that he told yeah that was a good one that was my favorite Go ahead that and was tell in it. kentucky Go ahead and tell uh it. i hope i can do it justice but well, if, uh, if, if, you, if you're missing details i'll try to fill them in okay well from what i understand this moonshiner uh typical guy who lived up in the mountains got a hold of him and, and started telling him his stories and the one that really got me the most was they used to hunt on this guy's land and this was your typical I can live off the land, I live off the grid, and I don't need the help of anybody type guy. He was just a grizzled old mountain man type. And the guy's dad, was it his dad or his grandfather? His dad, wasn't it? Had known this man since they were in school, and he had always been that way, just tough as nails. And one day, the dad gets a phone call. Uncle, it was his uncle, that's what it was gets a phone call from this guy and he happened to be at the house and he says, I need you to come up here to the cabin. I need to talk to you about something. And he, you know, the uncle said, well, it's getting late at night and I, I really don't feel like going out again. And the guy says, please, I, I really, I need for you to come up here. I need to talk to you about something. And he says, well, I got my nephew here with me. Do you mind if he comes too? And he says, nah, you, you bring him on. I'll, I'll talk to him too. And as they were driving up there, he was filling his nephew in on just what kind of a hard person this guy was and how self-sufficient he was and how much of a loner. And he said, and when he calls me, he says, I wouldn't have come, but this guy is not the kind of person to call you out at night for something that's not serious. And he got up there and the old guy said, 
I've been having problems with something around the cabin and I don't quite know what it is, but I've been seeing eyes and it kept getting closer and closer. And he said, I, uh, I finally got my gun out and I said, show yourself. I want to know who's out there. And they didn't answer. And he said, if you don't show yourself, I'm going to shoot you. And they didn't answer. And he says, I'm going to give you one more chance. And I ain't kidding. I will put a, gun, a bullet right in your chest. And he could see where just enough of him to see where he was standing. And he shot it right in the chest. And he said he knew he'd hit it, you know, because you can, you know, there's that little, you know, when you hit something. Mm -hmm. And he saw the, the blood. He knew that it had penetrated. But it turned around and, and ran off when it should have dropped it. And he said, I, I honestly, I don't know what for sure it was, but I've never seen anything like it in my life. And he said, I also know that I have a feeling I didn't do anything more than piss it off. And I have a feeling it's going to come back. And if it does, it's my own fault. I fired at it. But I want someone to know that that's what it was if it comes back. Well, they sat there and visited a little while longer. And the uncle reassured him that it was going to be okay. And uh, they left. And I... I guess it must have been the next night they got another call and he was clearly upset. He was clearly hysterical. And he said, they're all around the cabin. They're trying to get in. And he was, you know, this was interspersed with shots. And he was saying, you got to get up here. We got to get up here. Something's they're going to get in. They're going to kill me. So the uncle hung up the phone and they jumped in the truck and they headed up there. But by the time they got there, the, there was a County Sheriff there. There was a vehicle with uh, un, unmarked vehicles with men not necessarily in uniforms there. And the sheriff stopped him and he said, I, I can't let you get beyond this point. And the guy said, well, I, I just need to know if my friend's okay. And I just need to know if he's alive. And he says, we don't know. And he says, but I can't let you go beyond this point. I really can't. And he says, well, tell me something. He says, I can't do that. I've been told I can't talk about this. Well, they went back to the house and the uncle who knew the sheriff pretty well went and talked to him later when he was off duty. And he said, look, I don't know what you can or cannot tell me. I just want to know if he's alive. And he says, all I know is that we can't tell you because they didn't find enough of him to determine whether or not he was alive. The only thing in that cabin was his foot. And I'm assuming a significant quality, quantity of blood. <laughs> and a significant quantity of blood. And I that story to me is one of the best stories I've ever heard. That's... Now whether or not the moonshiner was, you know, shining the moon a little bit, I don't know. <laughs> but that was a really good story. And unfortunately, after Brenton Son died, they took down his, his uh, channel and all of the shows. That's too bad because he had such a good show and he had a great narration style. Uh, Ryan Burke says, DA, me and JT will be getting a hold of you soon to get you down our way uh, for some fun and podcast. Love your show, buddy. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the, 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 these are the guys over at the Horror Chronicles podcast. They're from Rolla, Missouri. I'm going to be heading up their way really soon. We're going to be doing some uh, some looking around for the, they just a couple of years ago. They had an Ozarks Howler sighting just outside of Rolla, and I'm going to go up and film in the locations. And there's been some interesting cryptid activity around Rolla, so I'm going to go up with the guys from the Horror Chronicles and uh, see if we can get some footage and get some stories and maybe talk to the eyewitnesses. That would be freaking awesome. So hopefully that's coming up soon. Ryan, brother, thank you for being here, man. Uh, let's see. Patty said there was a bobcat on our, uh, a bobcat in our house at their house last night. That's all I need to go outside. Just thought I would share. Well, a bobcat will tear you up. I mean, you don't. If you got small dogs, don't let them out. If there's a bobcat, they can and will eat small dogs. It is not uncommon. Or cats, house cats, they'll catch those too. Uh, Patty says if I ever do go, D A U and family are coming with. Heck yeah, we'll be happy to. <laughs> Irene says. Uh, Thank you. You and Naomi are awesome as well. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Josh says freaking Agent Blue showed up. <laughs> <laughs> yep, sure did. He was ready to call. Uh, and, um... 
Can't call Steve in uh, Lilly. Steve Lilly. Steve Lilly. Yeah, there you go. Patty says, sorry, I meant to say, say enough reasons for me to not go outside anymore. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Sal Paso says, Agent Blue needs another punch in the face. <laughs> Facebook user says, says, what's up, Naomi and DA? Hey, how's it going? Um, you, uh, we're not seeing your, I bet that's, I bet that's uh, Robert Miller, but we're not seeing, uh, not seeing your, uh, your name pop up. If you will go to, where's it at? I know I've got it set up here. Right here. If you go to that website address and land, uh, land, land log into that, it will authorize the use of your name and we'll be able to see your name in the chat and know who we're talking to. Uh, if you don't want to do it, that's that's perfectly fine. I understand that some people don't want their name going out on on the on the air or in public like that. But if you want us to be able to be able to respond to you by name, that's that's how you how you do it. Uh, I'm gonna give a quick shout out while we're there. Uh, Naoma, of course, is famous from the uh, this particular the Dixie Cryptid podcast with YouTube slash uh, sl- dot com slash c slash Dixie. Blah, if blah, I could blah. speak English, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> let me rewind that. <laughs> YouTube.com slash C slash Dixie Cryptid. Awesome, awesome content over there. And her her uh, her baby with the What If It's True podcast, <laughs> which you can just go to what if it's true podcast.com. Uh, awesome shows there. I've been trying to to send a little content their way myself, but they have got some amazing stories and some of the best encounters. And uh, some of them were really creepy out, like the the one that you guys did on the What If It's True uh, about the poltergeist. That yeah, one was yeah. pretty creepy. Yeah, that was a really good one. <laughs> I like that one. Josh, I am totally infamous. You know that. <laughs> Werewolf says there's some interesting human activity around Rolla. <laughs> That's true. One of the coolest things about the University of Missouri at Rolla are I think they changed the name of it. They actually built a scale model of Stonehenge. Uh, and it's it was before they built the building next to it, one of the computer science buildings, They you could actually use it as a, so, a stellar observatory. But now that massive building's next door and it killed half of it. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to, while I'm in Raw, I'm going to go film at the Stonehenge too. Sal so says, <laughs> DA got his tongue wrapped around his eye tooth and couldn't see what he was saying. You ain't wrong, brother. <laughs> And S. Dresden says, Agent Blue, Steve Lee voice. Yeah, he's shitting you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all just Ghibli. It's all, all talking Ghibli. <laughs> uh, so, so you want to let's jump into, into some of the, uh, the let's other get accounts? Into the juicy ones. Let's get into the juicy ones. Yeah, you go, brother. Okay. Um, there is one that, that particularly uh, fascinated me. Uh, there was a 74 year old lady just out that lived just like in the county adjoining LBL, uh, walked the same trail near her house every day for years because she liked to go out and get her exercise. She was still considered spry and in, in good shape. Um, she went out for a walk and didn't come back. Uh, so they sent out a search party and they found her dragged off the trail. She had been mauled to death by a pack of wild dogs that uh, they never found and when they Teeth sent the team yeah it was the bite <laughs> radius was a very big dog and uh the when they sent in samples to the lab it came came back unknown canine uh but the official cause of death death is listed as uh as a attack by a by a dog pack that a wild dog pack that they never found and this lady had literally been torn apart um that's not wild dogs uh, not in my opinion. You don't get she didn't get dragged off the trail and, and dismembered. Um, there, there apparently is a hell of a lot of wild dog attacks in Kentucky because not very far from there, just a few miles away, a 13 year old boy was killed in the exact same manner on the side of a hill overlooking his house. Mm-hmm. Wild dogs, and nobody heard it. But the witnesses that say, uh, that saw it described seeing you know, seeing well, when they called nine one one said the kid had been attacked. They described one large canine that ran very strangely when it went up the hill, like almost as if it was on two legs. Isn't yeah, that's that not amazing. in the that's not in the official police report. It's listed as that is atta- not Clifford. Right, that is officially listed as attacked by a pack 
of wild dogs, but witnesses accounts are very, very different. Uh, so I don't, put, I don't put a whole lot of water, a whole lot of stock in there. I don't think their, their, their bucket holds a lot of water for these wild dog attacks because witnesses are coming forward and saying very different, you know, they're saying canine and a lot of them are saying upright canine. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, within those are just in a, within a few miles of each other. Yeah. That's pretty sad. Uh, Northwood script is the attack. It was definitely not a pack of chihuahuas. <laughs> she just would have had her ankles destroyed. Yeah. I, can Mills says, I heard that. the story of the old lady. That is sad. And I believe that was another one where, um, was it the old lady that they wouldn't let her, they wouldn't release the body in an unsealed casket? Right. She had to have a, a closed casket. Mm-hmm. Of course, if she was torn apart, they probably wouldn't have had an open casket anyway. More than likely, yeah. Uh, Chris pointed out, it's called Missouri s and Yeah, Missouri Science and Technology now. I knew they uh, changed the name of it, but when back I, when I, I was I stomping would- around... Yeah, I thought it was Missouri sick and twisted. <laughs> that's 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 the people that live in the area. Uh, okay, well, I I was wrong. I saw S and T, and I thought it was something else. But you know, you can draw your own conclusions on that one. No witnesses to the attack on the old lady, but there was a witness who saw the creature fleeing in the attack on the thirteen-year-old boy. Yet both are listed uh, as you know the the the, the uh, lab result. Rip, Lab results came back as unknown canine, and the, the official listing of cause of death is a pack of wild dogs. So you can draw your own conclusions on that one. I'm I'm pretty uh pretty sure I know what I think it is. I'm reminded of um, 3,500 lumen light illuminated the fog. 35. You know who wrote that sentence? Mm-mm. <laughs> yeah. No idea. Do you know how hard that is to say? <laughs> Do you want to know how many minutes of my uh, pod of my recording were me repeating that sentence so I can say it without tripping over my tongue? <laughs> well, this is the exact light I wrote about in in, in that scene. This is the Protac HL5 3500 lumens light. Woo! <laughs> I carried yeah. this thing for a long time on duty and I can tell you, you can light up a field when you're looking for somebody with this thing. <laughs> Only problem is that 3,500, 3,500 lumens, you don't get a lot of burn time. I can kill the, thank God they're rechargeable, but you, you know, 20, 30 minutes, you're, you're going to start seeing it going. Whoa. Well, I'm going to tell you, uh, karma is getting even with you tonight for, <laughs> for that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> It was, Can, uh, I, I like throwing in a tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you got lumen illuminated and, <laughs> and lit, <laughs> you get a lot of cuss words with DA <laughs> surrounded. <by him. laughs> cussing the cussing that that more that moronic bald writer. <laughs> Josh says DEX mocking of the remix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Cryptidville says, have a great evening, everybody. Time for me to go to bed. I'll listen to the remainder of the show tomorrow. Well, thank you for being here. I'm glad you joined us. Uh, and I hope you'll join us again on Saturday. Um, Saturday, we're still going to be discussing Dogman, but it's going to be a little bit different. Um, our guest is from England. He's a cryptid researcher, a cryptozoologist out of England. Uh, he's got a wealth of information and he, he's got his own YouTube channel. And uh, you know, definitely check that out. But we'll go into more detail on that on Saturday. But uh, it's it's interesting the similarities that they're finding in the same some of these accounts we're talking about tonight that have happened in England. So yeah, definitely tune in and tune in. Guess that check that out. I speak uh, a little bit of English. <laughs> blinded by the light. <laughs> yeah. uh, Irene says there was an attack like that just just north of the Wisconsin state line in 1976 or 67. Um, yeah, there's, those attacks happen everywhere. In fact, uh, there's some, some that have happened up in Maine recently that have been fairly ongoing. And I'm, I'm going to be pulling some research on that soon too. But, uh, some of the, the, the activity up in Maine's pretty, pretty hopping. Yeah. 
Josh says, what's up, Greg? Night crypt, uh, good night, cryptid. Good night, cryptid. <laughs> Aircraft landing lights are far brighter than that flashlight. Yes, but far less practical to carry on a duty belt. Dresden <laughs> oh. says, perhaps the attacks on humans by dogmen are of the ones created in labs by men as opposed to the actual members of the species. It was no way to know. I mean, you can't tell one way or the other. Um, you know whether they're whether they're natural creatures or lab born, but like I said, the 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 the, the, the accounts of these creatures go back hundreds of years. Um, so I, I I would think it's just a creature that's already in that area. Uh, it's been in that area, the land between the rivers, now the land between the lakes for centuries, and he goes back to French trappers before it was a state of, uh, of attacks happening in that area. And the native Americans talked about attacks in the area. So whatever's in that area in the LBL area is aggressive. And it's, it's confirmed mm. that it, it definitely attacks people, attacks and often kills. Hmm. Oh, this RJ says, cool. love that light. Good night, Cryptidville. Thank you for joining us, man. Good night, Cryptidville. Josh says, Dresden, sadly, we have no proof they're lab-grown versus natural to assume they're all natural uh, until otherwise. Yeah, I think it's entirely possible some of them could have been could have been modified in a lab, but whether or not they escaped is kind of up in the air. Um, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of the fault, default. My default mode is, is law enforcement training, and I go with, you know, physical evidence, you know, until I have a reason not to. Uh, so you know, the the accounts and the and the and the eyewitness accounts of these creatures go back for more than a hundred years. So I'm going to think it's something that's already in that area. Uh, Northwoods, I ran ran those on all four bulb headlight cars, the 13 volt landing lights. That'll get somebody's attention. Uh, RJ says works like a weapon. It's so bright on strobe that it's crazy. Yeah, it's like you're throwing a disco if you throw that thing on strobe. Every person with a uh, has seizures. See that with a seizure disorder is gonna yeah. fall over. I won't be running from you anymore. No, that's uh, true. Josh says the First Nations had violent stories before labs were created. Very, very true. Um, Chris says going down to Cookville, Tennessee, Monday. You've changed my RT from one sixty five to one twenty four, so I can drive by LBL to get a lay of the land. Definitely check it out. Um, I, I'm the idiot that went in there after dark, uh, but the, a lot of the locals told me not to not to go in there after dark. Um, you know, the people the, over in Paducah were like, "Hey, it's a great place to go check it out. You might see something, but don't go over there after dark." On the other hand, Grand Rivers is like, "Yeah, go for it." Yeah, we'll Grand Rivers like, anyway. "Oh, we never heard of anything like that. <laughs> no, it doesn't exist. No, get out of my store." <laughs> I, <laughs> I got that reaction from one guy. Uh, do you know I think he got out of a lot of places for a lot of reasons, but never for that. <laughs> Lexington says, do you know of any current attacks in LBL? Uh, supposedly th this year so far, there are eight missing people in the northern part of LBL that have not been found. Uh, hmm. you, you can call that whatever attack, whatever kind of attack you want. Maybe they fell, you know, fell in the lake and drowned. Uh, but eight missing people in that concentrated area is kind of is, is suspicious on its own. Uh, but, you know, if you wanted to say it was a mountain lion or a bear or whatever, just remember what I, what my personal experience was. I spent four days and nights in LBL. Uh, granted, I didn't spend the night in the park, but I was prowling around till the wee hours of the morning. Until my wife would text me and say, when the hell are you coming back to the condo? We want to eat. Um, but I, I spent four days running around LBL in, in the daytime and the night. And across the canal over where our condo was, there were deer running around our Congo condo. We'd throw bread and stuff out and they'd come up there. Um, we, we were feeding ducks and there were all kinds of wildlife. We saw possums and raccoons and everything. You cross that canal in North LBL and there was nothing, not so much as roadkill in four days in the woods there. I did, I did not see a single animal, not one. And I've never had that experience in the woods. And I've spent half my life traipsing around the woods of the Ozarks. I have never been in a place where I didn't see not one animal in four days. And that's one of the creepiest things I found about LBL, especially the northern part, is I saw nothing. I read a really interesting... Um, Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, 
it, it was a story uh, a group of people had gone in definitely um, doubters and they had filmed their their adventure they got in uh, a lot of people uh, aren't aware but there's more than just a uh, dog man and bigfoot activity in the lbl there's a lot of paranormal activity and there's a lot there's a a mystery light in the in the lbl that supposedly follows you and they had gone in basically looking for that but also because they'd heard about dog man and and the the blog is it's interesting but definitely tongue in cheek and um he talks about going to you know off to him by himself to go to the bathroom and he did feel a little uncomfortable he wasn't really cool with that but you know he laughed it off and he said it was a deer or whatever and then at about one o'clock in the morning they're sitting around the campfire and the dogs they brought with them started acting really strange they got really uncomfortable and they started one of them started looking off into the woods and growling and then uh, he got up and he started taking pictures with his camera and he caught some orbs and he said that was you know of course he didn't associate that with dog man although a lot of us do uh, but then he said they they decided to go get in their tents and go to bed and a couple hours later they were woke up by the sound of a pterodactyl screaming and then he says, feel free to now uh, um, start the pterodactyl of LBL rumors. But I'm thinking, how many things does this guy have to know or hear before he starts associating it with dog man? <laughs> wow, that is just absolute deliberate ignorance. <laughs> and they stayed. <laughs> I think North the screaming would have got me in my car and gone. I probably would have gotten me recording. Yeah, you can stay and record. I'll take the car and go, and you let me know when you need me to come back for you. <laughs> well, I'm telling so you, you're I not going to do that with a cell phone, not an LBL. <laughs> My cell phone signal sucked in LBL. <clears throat> You'll have a campfire. Smoke signals will work. Yeah, there we Just go. as well as the <clears throat> cell phone, because I ain't coming back. <laughs> not until it's daylight, the era. <laughs> That's right. Northwoods Cryptid said, something tells me cryptids probably wouldn't like the disco strobe lights. Probably not. Anything that's nocturnal and light sensitive, that strobe effect would have have a devastating effect on. Irene Dewitt says, my cousin was putting a new roof on a hunting lodge and something big showed up. He put four 30-30 rounds into the thing and it still ran off. Hmm. Um, are there still camping grounds in LBL? Yeah, but they're they're all uh, considered primitive camping grounds. They don't have any with like RV hookups, at least not in the north end. I didn't I didn't go get down to the south end and look, but all the campgrounds that I found in LBL on the north end were all considered primitive campgrounds. They we basically just pull back into the woods and you know you've got to bring in everything you need. You need your water, you need your food. Uh, if you want electricity, you're going to bring a generator because they're just bare bones campsites. Uh, apparently I got very close to the place where the, uh, uh, actual LBL event happened with a family of four. Uh, although I never actually found the exact location, uh, because it's supposedly really close to the nickel cemetery and I, I was all over that area. So I don't know if they've bulldozed it off or if I just missed the turn off or what, cause most of those roads are just barely marked and they go back into the woods pretty deep. And some of them, if you don't have a four wheel drive, I wouldn't try it. Um, and then there's also the account, uh, I was down at Demumbers Bay filmed down there and talked to a camper down there. And when I told him what I was there talking, asking about, uh, he clammed up, didn't want to talk to him. He basically just blew me off. I haven't seen nothing. I don't want to talk about it. Go away. And he walked away. I'm like, all right, fine, buddy. All right, I won't talk to you. I wouldn't let me film him. So I had to turn my camera off before I, I could film him. Um, but, uh, there were also, a two people killed down at Demumbers Bay. And uh, that's one of the, one of the other stories I'm still digging into. I keep finding references to two people killed at Demumbers Bay, but that's where it ends. I can't find anything. I can't find anything about the actual deaths. Uh, Sal Paso says, DA recently on the show, someone mentioned a family that was attacked at LBL. I couldn't find any information on it. Do you have any information I could look up? Uh, yeah. Well, let me, uh, let me get you one of the better accounts. Uh, I will, I will pop it up in a, uh, in the in the in the chat uh there's a lady who used to do a show uh, it was called the cloaked hedgehog and she did one of the best lbl accounts i've i've heard 
If you want to go back to the original, it comes from uh, an account from Jan Thompson. Thompson or Thomas? Thompson, I think. Thompson, In I think. Barton Nunley's book, uh, we, um, I started to say Weird Kentucky, and that's not it. It's one of, it, it comes from one of Barton Nunley's books. I've listened to a bunch of the different accounts of the Beast of LBL uh, and have even talked to uh, like guys like Jody Cook, who've spent a lot of time boots on the ground there and uh, actually spoke to one of the officers that was involved. Um, so I've got some, some pretty good, what I consider solid, reliable information. But as far as telling the story and giving you great details, the one I, the, the one I just posted in the chat room right now from Cloaked Hedgehog, she does an amazing job of recounting the entire story. And it's, it's, a, it's a great story to check out. Um, don't listen to it now. Stick with us. But uh, if, you've got, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you want to listen to a, a really good telling of the LBL story, uh, she goes into a lot, a lot of detail. Now, I, in some of the shows we've done before, we've talked about it in pretty good detail. But I think she does a better, a better story, a better job of relaying it in almost story form. You kind of get the feeling like you were there. Uh, yeah, campground and LBL. Yeah, if I could afford a a, a good camper, I would set up a base camp and we would spread out from there. I would take a number of people down there, and that's exactly what we would do. But I can't afford a camper yet, so one of these days. Uh, Awissa says search local papers and um, there there aren't any. The, yeah. the stories have just been... They, they get buried fast locally mm -hmm. because they don't want anybody locally knowing about it because their their local economy rides completely on tourists. And the the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the large fishing fishing events they have on the lakes every year. Uh, but if you go to, go, to, go to Grand Rivers, which is a neat little town, by the way. Not a lot there, but it's a neat little town. Uh, I do need to pl plug that in a book because there's a place there called Cave Pizza. Really good pizza. Really good <laughs> pizza. So that's going to show up in the next uh, uh, Apex Predator book because the next the next Apex Predator book is going to be you know dealing with LBL. Um, and uh, uh, but uh, they'll definitely mention that pizza place. But over there they don't they don't talk about it in Grand Rivers. A few miles away in Paducah, you know, they're all perfectly willing to talk about it, but they're not relying on the tourist trade from LBL um, and those two lakes. Those two lakes draw a lot of people there. And while I was there, I, I didn't see a whole lot of people in LBL inside the park itself. I saw some. Uh, I'm not, it, it wasn't like completely empty, uh, but there were some places that were deserted. Uh, I only saw one park ranger the entire time I was there, and that was a parks employee that worked at the Welcome Center, and that was it. Uh, but 95% of the people I saw in that area were on the lake. 95% of the people were probably tourists then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Zach says uh, several campgrounds in LBL, even horse and trail riders campgrounds last I knew. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, you know, just I didn't, when I was there, I did, there I, I, you could find those like the Bumbers Bay has got a few places you can camp. Uh, there's, an, there's another one. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but there's a couple of, well, a few of them that are just day use areas. They won't let you in after dark. Um, but there are a number of places you can camp, some primitive campsites all along through there. Um, but uh, there's, there, yeah, there's but, some good biking there, trails in there, too. Mm, there's some nice trails, hiking trails. Uh, I wish I was in better shape than I am because I would love to have gotten deeper in the woods. Uh, walking with a cane with limited mobility, I, I can only go so far. Uh, but I did a lot. Well, probably more than I should have, and I, and I paid for it for like the next month after we left there because I was, I was, I was in a lot, I was uh, in a lot of pain for like a month after we did LBL, and I'm I'm resting up for the next trip. We are we are definitely going back. You know, uh, speaking of bikes, a couple of years ago, and I did everything I could. I ser I used multiple search engines. I listened to YouTube channels. I could not find this story again. But a couple of years ago, there was a report of a young man who had left, I think, from uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, heading north up the river road. I remember road. this story. And, well, if you could remember it, can you tell it? Because I could not find an ounce of detail on it. It was about the two guys on the bicycles, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, two guys, uh, both, both physically fit. They did a lot of bike riding together. Uh, had long wanted to do... 
uh, a cross country tour on bicycles. They wanted to go from New Orleans to Chicago. And that was going to be their big trip. Well, one of them, they'd been putting it off and putting it off until one of them lost his job. And uh, the other one said, well, I can take take time off from mine. Let's just do this. So they they left and uh, made an arrangement with the, one of the one of the, uh, the guy's sister uh, that they would co- they, they took their cell phones and they had little solar charger packs that they would recharge their cells and, you know, and keep their cell phones charged. And he would check in with her daily. Well, Things progressed well. They left out of North, out of Louisiana. They rode all the way up out of Louisiana, went up through uh, part of Arkansas, and then across over into t- into Tennessee. Uh, they were kind of zigzagging back and forth, following the Mississippi River. Well, when they got to LBL, the LBL area, they decided they were going to camp out, even though some of the locals said it's probably not a great place to camp. They were tired, and they knew if they didn't didn't camp, they were probably not going to get through the place in the night because they, knew they, 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 were trying to, they were trying to beat a storm and it was catching them. So they decided just to find a place right there close to the road and camp. Well, after three or four days of them not checking in, his sister started getting really worried. And the last place she knew where they were going to be was in the land between the lakes. So she gets a hold of the authorities, gives them the description, give them the information, and they start backtracking this guy's cell signal looking for towers that it pinged. And the last place it last place it pinged was just before it entered the north end of LBL. So they start tracking it, looking for places they could have found, could have camped, and they never found a trace of either the cyclers, cyclists. But they found their their uh, their gear destroyed and the bikes. I think one of the bikes was up a tree, and the other one was like bent backwards around a tree. One uh, the bike pretty well tore apart. Yeah, one was pretty much mangled. The other had been thrown like thirty feet up into a tree. Um, and they never found a trace of either of the two. They found their gear torn up and scattered, but they didn't find either of the two cyclists. Um, so I guess, you know, we'll go by Kentucky's tendency for calling that a pack of wild dogs. Uh, I, I, I defy you to give me a pack of wild dogs that can destroy a bicycle around a tree and then chuck another one 30 feet up into the tree. Well, they climbed the tree and did it. Just big dogs. It there. Yeah, big Kind of like that guy. It's Clifford. Yeah. He was yeah. chewing on it, dropped it in the tree. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that, I'm glad that you were able to remember so much detail on that because that story fascinated me. But I couldn't find any information on it. Bless you know, you some of those stories just vanish. Yeah. Um, there, there, uh, there are a lot of stories that, that just freak me out. Um, I, was, I, I was looking to... At a documentary that was on on uh, Amazon, I hadn't watched it yet because you had to. You know, it was a pay to down, a pay to a pay to view it, and I hadn't I seen it yet. Sorry, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't do it. It was. I did it, something bad. it was okay, called the on. hound. It was called the Hound of Hannibal, and it was supposedly about dog man attacks up near Hannibal, Missouri. And I was like, hot dog! I got to go up to Hannibal. Uh, well, a buddy of mine watched it and sent me a message. He's like, hey, hey bud, don't 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 bother. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, don't worry about going up to Hannibal and filming. You're not going to find anything. I'm like, why? He said, because when you get to the end of this video, it said it's a work of fiction. And they were presenting it as a documentary. I'm like, those bastards. Damn you. I was so Shame pissed. on them. Shame, shame. Everybody knows your name. Spit on your name. Ugh. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, man. I was very, very disappointed. Uh, Sal says, DA, recently on the show, there someone mentioned a family that was, oh, yeah, we already did that one. Yeah. Uh, so you, uh, I posted that link. That should, uh, that should, the, the Cloaked Hedgehog is the best adaptation of the story. Uh, there are other, there are other places you can find that. Hell, just Google the Beast of LBL and YouTube. Just search Beast of LBL and you'll find 25 different accounts. The lady that story comes from, uh, Jan Thompson, has another interesting story that happened to her when she was a kid. Um, she and her, it was a, I believe it was a cousin and a bro- and her brother, or, well, anyway, there were three kids. They were home alone. The, the male, whether he was a brother or cousin, I don't know, had taken the dirt bike out and was just tearing up Jack out in the woods having a good time. And they were waiting for the aunt to get home from the grocery store. And all of a sudden, here he comes tearing down the driveway, uh, going way too fast. And he basically got to the end, skidded to a stop, jumped off his bike, trembling, and says, it grabbed me, it grabbed me. 
he clearly had a torn shirt. He was clearly bleeding and they were, un, you know, just dumbfounded. And he turns and he looks back in the direction he, he came from and they could sort of see it off there in the distance. So they went in the house, they locked themselves in, there were dogs out in the kennel and whatever it was. And, and I'm thinking it was a dog man, um, basically harassed the house until the ant got home. But when her car came down the driveway, it went off. It actually uh, broke it uh, through a window, shattered a window. I mean, they were scared to the point that they were hiding in a closet in a bedroom. And when the ant pulled in the driveway, it ran off and that's what saved them. And that's the same lady that told the, the original story to Barton Nunley about the uh, campers. That's awesome. So, yeah. Oh, this is how about the Paducah news? I have not checked uh, a lot of a lot of online places because unfortunately, I'm an online newspapers because unfortunately, most newspapers, including small town newspapers these days, you have to subscribe to the newspaper to be able to read their online articles. And I, I just don't I don't have the money to to subscribe to 15 or 20 newspapers to try to dig these up. Uh, my I, I, I just do deep dives in Google and then talk to people in the area. But unfortunately, most of these newspapers want you to subscribe to their to their paper before you can start digging their archives, which hopefully at some point I will be able to do. But uh, right now, you know, this is a labor of love. So <laughs> so I, I don't I don't have the uh, the uh, the funds to do do a lot of stuff like that. So hopefully that'll change soon. I have spoken with a lot of people who have done that. They've gone to the library, gone through the microfish. And the, the information just isn't there. Yeah, this a lot of that information, it'll it'll appear once and then gone. Uh, kind of like uh, when when uh, Steve and I were doing research into the Joe Bald Recreation Area, uh, we found um, we found articles linking eight different disappearances to the Joe Bald Recreation Area prior to it closing. Well, we thought that was really cool, and shortly thereafter, we went down there and filmed my video. Well, after Thomas saw movement in the video and we started really digging into Joe, uh, into Joe Bald, every one of those accounts are gone. We could find nothing linking to Joe, to Joe Bald, which is really weird. And that other campground I found where they bulldozed over the, the entrances, um, Coombs Ferry, mm -hmm. uh, there is nothing. I mean, you Google why why did they come, why did they close Combs Ferry or or you know information on Combs Ferry, and you get nothing. And there was a marina there, a large marina. You don't just shut those down. There you were a have couple a reason. places today that I was trying to research that I got the link, but when I tried to click on it, it the sites couldn't be found. I found that probably seven or eight times just today, where I could find the link to what I was looking for, but I couldn't get to the website. Mm -hmm. so, I, I found a, a lot of the uh, places I used to to read uh, Bigfoot Bigfoot accounts. A lot of those sites are just gone now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them that that and there were several that I, that were on just Alaskan accounts alone, where I read that story about the fisherman who the, uh, Bigfoot got onto his boat, killed his dog, and he eventually died from his injuries, but he made it back to civilization before he died. Um, th that account was on one of those sites, and it's completely gone. Yeah. Um, Melissa thinks that Cam did a story on the cyclist, and I don't remember that, but it's it's possible. Um, honestly, I've only uh, worked for him for the last year, but I listened to, I mean, I had listened to him for almost from the beginning. I just don't mm -hmm. remember that particular. I don't remember Cam doing one, but I do remember there yeah. being one. I will, I will do some digging in my archives and see if I can find that story. Uh, Lexington 73, 300. I read an account from a gas station attendant who talked to some of the state police at LBL not long after a gas station was menaced by something. She locked herself in a windowless back, back room. That's an awesome story. If you've got a link to that, I'd love to read that account or talk about it on here. Yes. Uh, Chris says, do you know of any reports at Merrimack or Woodson K State, uh, Woods State Park? Um, Merrimack here in Missouri, up at Merrimack State Park? Because if you're talking about you know, the Merrimack State Park here in Missouri, yes, I do. Uh, but I don't, I'm not familiar with Woods and K Woods State Park. 
I would have to dig uh, dig into that one. But I did hear some some interesting stories up near Merrimack. Um, Dresden says bike and or hiking trails or game trails for the adversary. True. I mean, you know, any animal, especially a pre- even a speci- specifically a predator, but any animal is going to take the path of least re- least resistance in the woods. And game trails are the easiest where place to find game. I mean, it's a lot easier to follow a trail than it is to slog through briars and thick underbrush and fallen logs. So on these bike trails, it would not be uncommon to see deer or possum or whatever. Uh, but like I said, in the north end of LBL, I didn't see a damn thing. And that astounded me. I mean, I was on some of those trails and I was I was off the beaten path. My minivan will surprise, surprise you at some of the places it'll go. And then once uh, Nick Valente got there, he, we had his Hummer H3 and that damn thing will go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And we took that in some deep places where I wasn't sure we were coming back out of. Uh, and we didn't see anything, no deer, no, I didn't even see deer sign. And, you know, generally you can, you can spot deer sign, especially you get there near the edge of the water. You can see paw prints, you can find deer scat, um, or even antler rubbings. I didn't find nothing. Not, I saw no sign of animals. I saw no animals in the north end of LBL and that freaked me out a little, well, more than a little. Uh, Marshall says, okay, y'all heading to bed. Thanks y'all. Marshall, thank you for being here. I hope you join us on Saturday. Have a great night, man. Good night, Marshall. Okay, so uh, what's, what's your next account? Well, um, I actually was going to cover uh, the three mini horses and the two dogs. Oh, go for it. Uh, Zach says the cyclist story might have been told by Dark Waters. Ah, that might have been. I will check the Dark Waters channel later. I will track that story down. Because yeah. I, I know I've heard it in more than one location. But the uh, weird thing is, is some of these smaller channels and some of these websites that posted accounts are vanishing. They are. Absolutely. Are you? It's it, it's strange. And I I just wonder how long before channels that I've where I've told some of these stories start to get hard to find. Um I've seen another channel that is referred to a website referred to as the Wayback Machine. I think they were able to find news stories that are no longer accessible through most search engines. If you could send me a link to that, that would be awesome. That is. I will say, though, that although I personally have not done it, I do know several people who have actually gone to some of these libraries and colleges and looked through physically looked through their papers and their microfiche and have not been able to find anything on the family story. Um, and the only people that seem to be able to tell you anything about it seem to be the ones who were the, the police officers who were there and those who have talked to them. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, so anyway, uh, over in Monroe County, Kentucky, which is not in the LBL, but it's really not that far from it. It's about three counties over, maybe four. Um, there was uh, a couple of years ago, four, no, three miniature horses and two dogs that were found dead. They had been, according to the sheriff's department, they had been attacked by a wild animal and showed signs of attack by a wild animal. And in fact, they found paw prints around these animals indicating a wild animal. And uh, they could not identify it. In fact, I believe it came back unknown cryptid when they ran the DNA or <laughs> unknown canine, my bad. And uh but the DNR got involved and they said, no, those were precision knife wounds and bullet wounds in those animals. Uh, the sheriff came back and said, no, there were no spent shell casings around there. There were no bullet wounds in those animals. There were no shells in those bodies. Uh, he determined it to be a wild animal attack. Therefore, no necropis- ne- autopsy on animal was done. Necropsy. <laughs> Thank you, uh, was done on them. But uh, the interesting thing is a lot of people around there since and shortly before that and since then have reported a lot of missing ducks and geese and chickens and, and livestock, small livestock in that area. 
And the sheriff still maintains, keep your kids and your small pets in the house. Keep well, there's one not hand. far from LBL uh, where two llamas were torn apart. And the reason <laughs> most people keep llamas with their livestock is they're pretty fearless. Uh, they, they've been known to stomp coyotes to death. Uh, they, they will protect a herd. If you have llamas mixed in with your small your farm animals, uh, they're very protective. Uh, they've they've been in accounts of llamas driving off wolves. Uh, llamas shockingly mean. They can do a lot of damage. Um, but something killed two llamas, tore them up pretty badly, and it was it was labeled an unknown canine attack because of the large canine prints found found around it. My sister used to own two llamas. Um, the only thing I. I I know that people do that, and I know they do that with uh, uh, donkeys mm -hmm. and burros, too. But I, I want to point out that they are still not prey animals. And although they are pretty fearless and they will put up a good fight, they're still going to end up being, you know, they're going to end up on the dinner table if a predator is serious about. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people do that. that. It's very common around here to find, you know, to drive past the pasture and see donkeys and llamas in them but it always discourages me because i think they're just adding to the menu <laughs> but boy I if it's a big what, enough predator very, it's going to eat what it wants that's right it's not gonna and i mean i've seen donkeys kick the heck out of things i really have i just i saw i saw a donkey double kick a coyote halfway across a corral one time <laughs> yeah I, and and I can attest to the fact that it hurts when you get kicked by animals like that. But uh, it always bothers me because I know it's a, a common, um, uh, I wanted to say habit, but that's not the word I'm looking for. Um, it just bothers me because they're still not predators. They are prey animals, just like the horses and the cows. And Well, you can't put a predator in with your animals because no, it's going to eat true. it. But, you know, my, my point is that they're still down here on the food chain, not up here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They just, they, they, they're, they're, just they're, they're harder more, to kill, but they're still edible. They have a little more fight in them and a little bit harder kick, but still. Irene says, here's one for you. I'm talking on my talking to my cousin on the landline and talking here on my smartphone. He said it was a wolf on two legs. <laughs> yeah. Well. There you have it. Now you know. Two-legged wolf. Dated a couple of those. <laughs> uh, oh. Animals are not weapons. As we as human beings should be mighty and wise uh, stewards. I agree. My opinion, too. I definitely agree. So anyway, what do you got? Oh, for the next one? Mm -hmm. um, there was a, an account uh, by a trucker uh, who was going across those rickety-ass bridges I filmed <laughs> who yes. caught one in his headlights about 3 o'clock in the morning as he was coming across from the Illinois side into, into the Kentucky side and reported seeing a wolf-like creature on two legs hauling ass from the edge of the bridge and then jump down into the marshland and the marshy area down beside the bridge where he lost sight of it. But, you mm. know, uh, he went into that nearest town and went in to get a cup of coffee, thought he was asleep at the wheel and uh, told him what he saw. And they're like, yeah, we see that all the time around here. And he <laughs> said, well, remind me to never stop here again. <laughs> Permanent reroute. Yeah. Alexa, <laughs> reroute my map. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. But that was the same bridge I was bitching about how rickety it was. Yeah, you can watch my LBL video, and I was grumbling about that bridge all the way across it. I remember that. Do they still have the Marquette and Joliet bridges in St. Louis? Are they still really scary to cross? Uh, I think one of those was torn down. I think it's the now the new big sweeping Stan Musial bridge. Uh, but uh, I know they tore one of the bridges down. Uh, but that Stan Musial bridge is really cool. Uh <laughs> We, yeah. we, in fact, uh, got a funny story about that big, big, really pretty arch span bridge, the Sam Musil Bridge. We were driving through St. Louis and we uh, we went down and looked at the arch. And I don't navigate much in downtown St. Louis. I try to avoid downtown St. Louis unless we're going to like a Cardinals game or something. 
uh, we've been up in the arch, you know, and now there's really nothing else I want to be down there for. Um, yeah. Unless we're, like I said, unless we're going to a Cardinals game, but uh, we were looking at the bridge and we were kind of taking side streets and getting closer to it to get a, get a better look at it. And then I realized I had forced myself into a position where I had to merge into traffic that was going out on the bridge. And I'm like, well, crap, I guess we'll get, a, we'll get across the bridge and turn around and turn around. And so we cross the bridge and we're looking down to look down at all the water and some of the barge traffic. And my, my and I'm looking at the water as I'm driving, you know, of course I, I can, I can like, glance and still drive, but I'm not paying attention to like road signs. I'm just like watching the road ahead of me and looking at the water. And my, my, my son in the back is patting me on and like, dad, dad. I'm like, what? He goes, look at the sign. I'm like now entering East St. Louis. I'm like, Oh hell no. We're turning around. <laughs> I don't care if I got a back across this bridge. It is not an armored vehicle. You don't need to go there. <laughs> yeah, I will take a big solid pass. <laughs> the moment we got across, I put, took the off ramp, turned, got went down the other off ramp, and got back across that bridge as fast as I could go. <laughs> yeah, I've been to East St. Louis a couple of times. Not yeah. a fun place. I will pass. <laughs> I don't blame you. Uh, Chris says, good night, y'all. Thanks for all your hard work and enthusiasm. Much appreciated. Thank you, folks. And Cam, I have no need for cable. Well, we hopefully <laughs> we can keep you entertained. Thank you for joining us. Hope you have a good night, Chris. Thank you for, for coming in tonight. Thank you. Good night, Chris. Lenita says, Cam drove Highway 78 when he came to see me. Yeah. You know, Lenita, you talk about the little th people or the little things on your property, and I wondered if they were similar to the ones in Cam's store yesterday. Is that like the puck wedgies? Uh, I don't know. They, it, I, I, I listened to the story twice, and I really couldn't figure out what they were. But they were definitely little. I know all the accounts of puck wedgies I've had uh, just were sinister. Yeah. And I don't mean left-handed. I mean, like, creepy as hell. Like they would lure people out into the woods to never be seen again and crap like that. And they'd, they, you could hear them going, calling you by name, trying to get in like, you know what? If I'm out in the woods and something calls me by name, I'm not going to see what it is. <laughs> I'm not going to do that if I'm in my house alone. <laughs> I hear my name called. I better be able to see the person saying it in the next two or three minutes. You remember uh, me telling you I had a weird feeling and I know, I know I'm probably going to people going to think I'm crazy. Uh, that I had a weird feeling that I, something had attached itself to us when mm -hmm. when I was in north northern part of LBL because I pranced around a bunch of old cemeteries late at night. Mm -hmm. um, well, since then, every time I will go through the kitchen, I will close cabinets, and I can turn around and come right back through it, and they're open again. Um, Has it been closing the cabinets for you? Do what? <laughs> Has it been closing the cabinets for no, you? No, something. Every time I go through, like two or three of the cabinets are open. Oh, I see. Uh, found oh. the dishwasher open. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's not the, it's not my boys. I've asked them that. It's not her. Uh, you know, she's saying it's an old house. Maybe they're just letting go. You know, so maybe. Uh, but I don't know. I just got, had a, a number of really weird things happen since we left LBL. Wow. That that's a little creepy. He might so want gonna, to burn some sage. I'm going to talk to my friends who are Navajo and <laughs> see if they'll perform a blessing way for us. Yeah, no doubt. I just talked. I just talked to him, my buddy Wes. I just talked to him just the other day, and uh, he was saying he's saying I was just telling my wife that we need to get together and barbecue and send up some smoke and and, and sit and talk and tell you guys tell you some of the stories from the reservation that'll that'll curl what little hair I have. Yeah. I am. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I don't know if I want to hear some of those stories. They're a little bit too creepy for me. But uh, well, we had a guy on the show one night uh, uh, that uh, worked on the on the Navajo reservation that uh, said he was driving home late. He was a medic and he was driving home late uh, in his pickup. And as he was approaching he saw somebody standing at the side of the road he turned his headlights up on bright to see him he said it looked like an old man uh long white hair gaunt uh wearing dark clothing and uh, he said as he was getting close he was going to slow down and see if the guy needed a ride he said but when the guy turned and looked at him it just he didn't look human and he freaked him out so he punched it uh and took off he said he said and he was pretty far from home. I mean, you, you get those distances out there on that on the in the desert, and it's pretty far apart. 
But uh, he said about half a mile down the road, what shows up in his headlight? But that same guy. Uh, mm. So he sped up again as he passed him. And he said this time kind of felt like the guy was watching him. I mean, like he like he just turned and locked eyes with him and just watched him as he went by. And then he passes him again. Wow. And then the fourth time it, he ran fit, over. it, it paced <laughs> to the it paced to the truck. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, he said. He said he went home immediately, locked himself, locked himself in the house, and grabbed half of the uh, half, half of the guns he owned and sat up all night. Wow! I said, "What'd you do about that?" He said, "Well, after that, I left the reservation. It wasn't very long. I got the hell out of there." I learned a hard lesson about going home uh, when I was single. I was I'd st- I worked a, a job that was sort of a hybrid between second and third shifts, so I'd get off around anytime between two and six in the morning and there was an all-night gas station and i went there i smoked at the time so i went there grabbed a couple packs of cigarettes filled up my car and the whole time that i was there there was a guy standing at his car on the other side of the the gas pump staring at me and he was just way too creepy for my taste and um i pulled out and he pulled out behind me and I went down the road, which was a pretty main thoroughfare. And I thought, oh, he's just following me. But I turned off on a side road just to make sure. And he turned with me. <laughs> and we did a few side roads. And then I thought, I just got to get home, lock myself in my apartment. I'll be fine. And darned if he didn't follow me to my apartment. So my hard lesson uh, that I learned is don't drive home. Drive to the police station. Drive to a friend's house. <laughs> Sick it on somebody else. But okay. don't go to your house. <laughs> I don't care what's following you. If it's following you, don't show it where you live. <laughs> no kidding. Dresden said, God protects your house, brother. Thank you, sir. Cody Hamilton says, so do you think Dogman inspired the werewolf? Uh, yeah, I think I think the Dogman is a legitimate creature, and I think it's been around a long time. And there, there's sightings all over Europe. And I think the Dogman is responsible for the werewolf legend. Uh, I, I think agree. you know you you the reason the werewolf legend exists is somebody would go into the woods and then you know later that night someone would see a dog man and then the next day they'd see the guy come back and you know they not have an explanation for where he'd been oh he must have turned into that werewolf turned into that wolf creature I think the dog man is the origin for the werewolf story I don't think it's the other way around uh, mainly because the Native Americans have been seeing him on this continent since before European settlers got here. Um, so, and that's, and I know, you know, uh, like in ancient Romania, the werewolf legends, uh, I, I know those have been dating back centuries as well. Uh, but the native Americans didn't have any mythology about people that other than, other than certain shaman who could turn into other forms and they gave us the skinwalker legend, but these creatures were just described as the Ulonga dog Lala, the, 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 the long dogs, uh, the, 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 the dog like people, um, uh, and uh, even even uh, I believe it's the I cannot remember the chip. No, it's not the Chippewa. Um, There's one of the Indian tribes that d- that d- talked about a war that it happened between Bigfoot creatures. Oh, and the Choctaw. The Choctaw, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Choctaw talked about a war between Bigfoot and Dogman over the territory. Mm-hmm. They call themselves Chata. Yeah, uh, Choctaw is kind of a derogatory term. That's yeah. not their name for themselves. No. Uh, you believe you're the one that told me that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I... Yeah, they don't go by the Choctaw. They're the Chata. I guess Choctaw was a kind of a derogatory name given to them by the Cherokee. <laughs> yeah. Um, but everybody states. knows them as the Choctaw. If you right. look them up in the in the, on Google, they're going to show up as the Choctaw. Uh, but they have legends dating back, you know, centuries of of Bigfoot Bigfoot creatures and dogmen fighting each other. Yeah, um, I, I remember reading that account several years ago, and I was fascinated by it. Irene says he told me to ask you if he knew anything to kill this thing, and it's a it's a upright upright canid. Uh, I've only I've only heard one account where one of these creatures have been killed. Uh, there was a farmer, and I want to say it was someplace in I want to say Tennessee. I think it was I think it was Eastern Tennessee who'd had a lot of trouble with a an upright canine coming in and killing his farm animals, and he caught it one time trying to get into the into the barn and he shot it with a shotgun 
hit it with buckshot. It spun it away from the door. It snarled at him and ran off. Uh, he tried several times and had shot it multiple times with different rifles. He's trying, you know, time, like a 68 caliber Hawken. You know, he was using bigger and bigger guns to try to put this thing down. And the only thing it ever did was like knocked it down a couple of times and it would get up and run off. And then it would come back the next night and take more livestock. Well, the guy got tired of it. And he, you know, he, he said, well, if this is a, this is a wolf creature and, and, and anything in the legends are, are true, then I'm going to try silver and silver. I don't think silver works because it was a werewolf. I think silver works because it's a pure metal. It's one of the purest metals. It's used in a lot of religious ceremonies and, and so, and silver is considered sacred by a lot of native American traditions. Uh, and for good reason. So anyway, this guy went through his change drawer and he found a bunch of silver dimes dating back before 1963. And he reloaded multiple shotgun shells with a dozen dimes in each of them. And the next time that thing came around, he put two barrels of shot, uh, one of his double barrel shotgun into that thing with 24 dimes, 24 silver dimes. And it dropped and it stayed there and he buried it on his farm. He didn't, he didn't want to show it to anybody. He didn't want to, we didn't want anybody coming, digging around and looking at it. All he wanted to do was to kill it. And the story was told by his children. So that's the only account I've ever heard where one's been killed. It was killed with shotgun shells reloaded with silver dimes. Interestingly, there was a time when silver was considered far more valuable than gold. True. Uh, Facebook says, could it have been a skinwalker? Possibly. Um, you know, if, if, if it was a skinwalker, you know, normal rounds wouldn't have, wouldn't have killed it. But uh, according to uh, according to the lore, uh, the only way to kill a skinwalker is with a with a mixture of white ash, and I believe I believe it's silver. But it, it's you know, but uh, silver alone won't do it. So if it'd been a skinwalker, I don't think it would have done it. Hmm. Orwell says, "Don't look down," but I think you're correct. You have something attached to you behind your shoulder. Yeah, two of them, three, four of them, five of them. <laughs> Maybe later I'll give you a milk bone. <laughs> RJ says, can't go wrong with fire. People don't use fire as much as they should. UFO, dog man, Bigfoot, mother-in-law, fire is the answer. I go with that. Fire kills most things. <laughs> fire is the great cleanser. Oh, and he says, the pic I sent you with the man inside the black square is a little person. Okay. Um, Irene says, take some sage and light some of it and place it on your kitchen table. Dresden says, stand fast with God. I have to agree with Dresden on that, to be honest with you. I think I'd rather pray than burn sage, but a lot of people burn sage. You know, I, I am not the one to dismiss anybody's beliefs. Uh, yeah. So if I had something like truly I consider dark and demonic haunting my house, I'd try a Lakota shaman, a Catholic priest, a rabbi, whoever I get to come in the house and say a blessing. Whatever yeah. works, just get rid of it. <laughs> That's your three S's for you right there. <laughs> you know, it used to be shower and shave. Now it's mm -hmm. shoot, shovel, and shut up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Most definitely. He says, I like fire. The, I like the fire answer. <laughs> Northwood says, but napalm would probably work on dog men. Yeah. RJ, you're right. The riddle, the enigma of steel. Steel you can believe in. Only steel. <laughs> Rizwar says, uh, says, yeah, something is going on. A few minutes back, I went from the beginning of the show to live out of nowhere. <laughs> wow. Well, RJ, you're not wrong about steel, which is why this stays fairly close to me, no matter where I'm at. And that would be the bounty from from Scallywag Tactical. That's uh, quite a butter knife you got there. Yeah. <laughs> That'll give you a little bit of a scratch. Yeah. Close shave anyway. Now that doesn't do the job. I've got the, the boarding axe right beside it. <laughs> That's amazing. Let me see what I have. Uh check my weaponry out Let get your knitting see. needles 
Those will do some yeah. damage. Yeah. Those will do some damage. I think I have something just a little bit more lethal than that. It's right here. This bad boy right here will drop a man in a heartbeat. Grab one pubic hair and pull. Ding. I tell you what incapacitated me What's is that? one year one year for Christmas, my wife bought me uh, a trimmer trimming kit for my beard, um, but it also had a nose hair trimmer. And that was, oh, that was that was great. I mean, you know, it worked like crazy. If you're going to invest in a nose hair trimmer, get a good one. <laughs> Don't get one that just comes free with a little with a little beard trimmer kit because when those things get dull, they will grab a hold of hair and pull it right out. And if you've ever never had six or eight nose hairs yanked out at one time, you haven't lived. That was a world of pain I have rarely encountered. And I that brought they... First words I didn't know I knew. I think they're attached to your eyeballs because they have a direct effect on them. <laughs> well, they felt like the roots were up behind my eyeball when those things pulled them out. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. And I, I cussed in languages I didn't know. <laughs> I, I grew up in the Assembly of God Church, and that was my first experience with speaking in tongues. <laughs> I just, I just learned, I just uh, developed new languages when that happens. <laughs> Uh, Cody says, how do you think the dog man came to be by magic or act of nature? Uh, I kind of think it's always been here kind of like Bigfoot. I think it's, I think it evolved in, in, in kind of a, like a parallel, a parallel development. Um, and I've got kind of a weird theory on it that not everybody would, not everybody needs to agree with me on it. It's just my theory. I think because a lot of the accounts, the people that have seen dog man have seen it on all fours. And before it got up, they heard a popping sound. <laughs> And to me, that would indicate something was happening because it, it shows up in multiple accounts. I think they have the ability to rearrange their hands. Uh, and because all the descriptions of dogman hands, they describe them as having more digits, kind of like a raccoon's hands, not like, a, not like human hands. I think it's an evolutionary adaptation. And I think they might be offshoots of, of uh, dire wolves. Hmm. And that's just my, my personal theory. Uh, and I, I, I can, I could do a whole show on that. Uh, but I, but I, I would need to load up all my pictures and print ready my argument because I, I truly believe that a creature like that probably if it like, like for example, we, uh, the, we domesticated wolves to make the modern dog. I think di dire wolves or even other types of wolves were able to observe what we were doing and mimic what we were doing with paws, and eventually it became an adaptation. So, might not be a popular theory, might not even be a correct theory, uh, but my theory is that dogmen evolved to use hands, and they're still very much, very much animals. I actually, uh, I, I agree that I think that dogmen and direwolves are closely related, and. I'm going to go that far and I'm not going to go any further, but I do agree that with you on that theory, I do think there's a close relationship, if not the same animal. Um, well, I've got a big argument for it. I should do it. I should do a whole show just on that. I've got pictures and diagrams and pictures of raccoon yeah. hands versus human hands. And, you know, I've got all kinds of stuff. I did, I did it once before, but it's been almost a year ago. So I probably ought to dust off my notes on my my dogman direwolf theory and and represent yeah. that because I, I I I think I present a pretty compelling argument. Yeah, I I agree. I, I think that I haven't seen that show. I should probably go back and watch it. But it's been a theory of mine for a long time, and I'd like to see the evidence that you offer. So you should dust off your notes when we do that. Okay. Yeah, we have to have to do that in the near future. Then, uh, on my on my uh, dire wolf uh, dogman descendant theory, um, and, and like I said, I've got I've got a lot of notes on it, and I can and I can fill a lot of lot of time on it. But I don't know what file I put all the picture archives in, as uh, we well right after I did that show. God, it's been January, February, somewhere in that ball ballpark. Uh, my desktop computer died. Uh, I was able to recover all my data, but my my son, he, who builds computers, uh, had to build me a new computer system. 
Uh, basically most of my, most everything, my computer was old and it was like struggling to keep up to, to stream. Uh, so that they built me a better system when uh, we've got, I've got a good computer that works now, but we had to go back into that old hard drive and extract everything. So I haven't fully unpacked everything and put it into uh, files. So I'm still kind of in the process of that. I'd, something I've just been putting off doing and I need to do it, but I, I got to go through those files and find all my, all my notes and everything on, on the, on the dire wolf theory, but that's something I need to do in the near future. I think that would be a good one. I agree. I'd, I'd be interested. Uh, Reservoir says, just curious, DA, do you think the dire wolf survived time? Yes, I do. I think it's still in remote because it's, it existed alongside modern wolves. It wasn't that much bigger that it could be considered megafauna. Um, it was bigger. In fact, I think I've got one of those graphics. Yes, I do. Here we go. Let me uh, take the uh, the chat bubble down. But that would be in comparison for a coyote in the front, a wolf, a good sized bear, and then what the dog man reports are. And if you find the comparisons that they made to modern wolves to dire wolves, the size comparisons really aren't off by much. Um, and it, it's the right size category. It's the right temperament category. It's the right animal. So I very yeah. much think, I very much think that that dire wolf evolved. Yeah. Because a wolf on its hind legs would look a human in the face, but a dire wolf on its hind legs would be very much like that. Mm hmm. And these stories go back a long time. Wolves attacking people. And look at that. That's a normal wolf in the foreground. Look how much bigger that wolf out there is. Granted, that's just an artist's depiction, but that would be your dire wolf. It would be that much bigger than a wolf. Wow. Sorry, that's another story there entirely. <laughs> This one, I don't know the origin. I can't give you the, uh, I can't give you the 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 background on this picture. It was it, it popped up, so it popped up one time, and then somebody sent me the uh, the same photo. Uh, somebody cl claims to have taken this picture, but I cannot find who took the picture or where it originated. Uh, I've got to b do some backtracking and digging, but the picture's kind of neat. I don't know if it's real or not, so I'm not going to say, yes, this is a definitive picture, but it, the picture alone will, will make you think. Wow. If it's Photoshop, it's a damn good one. That's all I'll say. I don't know if it's real or not, but uh, this one came to me kind of secondhand. Uh, look at how much, look how much longer the arms are where, from where the knee joint is. Yeah. That's not human. Human's arms don't hang down that low. And I've seen lots of bears walk on their hind legs, and that's not how they walk. Nor are their front paws shaped like that. That's a hand. But if yeah. you look at it, it looks like it's got an extra extra little digit on the on each finger pad, much like a raccoon. Mm -hmm. So if it's not a real picture, it's a compelling picture. So I, I can't I can't give you the provenance of the picture, uh, but I'm I'm gonna keep I'm gonna go back through my emails and try try to find who sent me that picture originally. But when I was prepping for tonight's show, I was looking at my pictures, my dog man pictures, and I went, oh, throw that one in there. We'll talk about that one a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, oh, here's another one. Now, now I think this one is a still taken from a YouTube video, but it was another picture that was sent to me. Oh wow. If I looked out my kitchen window and saw that. It'd be someone else's kitchen window by the end yeah, of the week. <laughs> yeah, I would say the house would be on the market the next day. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, here's another great image. Was the stock dog trying to keep the dog man at bay. Now this, granted, this is artwork. Somebody drew this, but it's a really cool picture. <clears throat> I am. Uh... Uh, got access to a photograph taken not far from here. I can't show it. It's not my picture. Um, in fact, I don't even have a copy of it. She showed it to me off of her phone, but I, because of who it was, I believe her. And it was a picture of a dog man that uh, was standing by a fence that was, the fence was here, the barn was here, and it was sort of standing on the edge of the barn right behind the fence. 
and um, it looked the way it was standing there. I would have guessed the fence to be about three feet, but she said it was the fence was over four feet tall, and that fence came to that thing's, you know. Well, you can't see me doing this, but you're gonna have to assume that I'm holding my hand somewhere down around the navel. And I was amazed at how tall it was. And then I realized, yeah, that was a barn. You know, that that was a pretty tall building it was standing next to, but it it would it looked small compare in comparison. The thing that bothered me about it and what bothers me a lot about the things that I'm reading these days is the fact that it looked a lot more like what people are calling gugways, gugways these days. Mm -hmm. And I, as terrifying as dogmen are to me, and frankly, it's the most terrifying thing that I've ever come across to date uh, until I started reading about these stu stupid gugways. <laughs> the gugways and, frighten me. They really do. The picture was taken not far from where I live. And so that really terrified me. Mrs. Chef Yoda said, I had a neighbor back in the 80s whose family came from Italy, and he told me that his grandmother told him that werewolves existed and she saw them in the old country. Uh, yeah, our guest on Saturday night, he's very knowledgeable in, in cryptids of Europe. Uh, he's a, a, a cryptozoologist from England, and he's done extensive background checks. Uh, no, not background. He's done extensive research into into the dogman phenomenon, specifically in England, and he's got some really good videos. And I'll uh, we'll talk more about that again on Saturday night. And uh, his we'll have his website and everything. Uh, but he's he's going to be a great guest, and I think you guys are really going to like that show. Oessa says, "Well, Russian wolfhounds and cheetahs are closest relatives to to what?" Uh, Facebook user says the program Game of Thrones, they talked about dire wolf like a rock. Dire wolves are, uh, dire wolves exist, existed in the fossil records. Uh, there are two or three different versions that I've seen pictures of. Some of them appeared to be shorter haired than others. Uh, kind of like how, like if you look at mastiffs, um, I've had an English mastiff and a bull mastiff at that mastiff at the same time. They're wonderful dogs, amazing temperament with my kids, but my, my bull mastiff had short hair like a bulldog. And my English Mastiff had enough hair where he would shed a, a chihuahua pretty much daily. Uh, you, <laughs> so that's where those little jerks come from. <laughs> you know, kidding. But uh, just, you know, the, essentially the same breed of dog because a bull Mastiff is essentially all it was was a gamekeeper's dog that was bred by breeding an English Mastiff to a bull English bulldog. And that's where the, the bull Mastiff comes from. Uh, bull mastiffs are wonderful dogs, and I will have a couple more one day. I, I, I love mastiffs. I love big dogs. Yeah. Uh, what is this? Ancient Romans had eyewitness stories of them. Yes, they did. I've got I've got a picture of that somewhere. Let me uh, see if I can find that real quick. Give me just a moment. You can uh, say something if you want to. I'm though. sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I, <laughs> You're all right. For whatever reason, my time. husband tried to call me, and, and I know he knows that I'm on the show tonight. Um, what are we looking for? Help me out here. Oh, I was looking for an image. Uh, well, Bobfoot showed up tonight. Hey, Bobfoot. So, What's up, Bubba? Good to see you. You too, man. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> that dog regularly sheds enough you can knit another dog from it. That's a fact. If you've ever had an English Mastiff, that dog, oh my God. We would, we uh, like at least twice a week, we would sweep the house and the dustpan would be overflowing like this with the mound of hair off that dog. And I, I looked at him, I'm, I'm like, good God, Xander, you're, how, why are you not bald? <laughs> I don't know how a dog could shed that much and still have thick hair, but he sure managed it. Well, I can't find the image I'm looking for, but I, I did find a goodie. All right, let's see it. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. 
not not what I want. To yeah, do. I don't think I want you know a, a quarter inch of glass separating me from a dog. <laughs> I did find another comparison. Very, these are variants of yeah. dogmen. Nasty. Hmm. Yeah, that's something I want to run into. No kidding. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of running into something you know that big and that nasty. I would uh, take a big old pass on that. <laughs> Holy moly, I found the image I was looking for. Yeah, let's see it. Oh, wow. That's that's actually really good. <laughs> that's a really cool image. Yeah. Who did that? Uh, it's down at the bottom, but I can't read it. Yeah, I can't. I'd have it. to pull up the old image. It's a beautiful image. Yeah. Sort of reminiscent of Frank Pizzetta. Mm -hmm, very much so. That's the kind of cover I want to get for the fantasy novel that I'm working on. I want to find like somebody that can do that fantasy style like that. Mm -hmm. I, I really want a really cool, like hand-drawn, beautiful fantasy cover for this fantasy novel. I I'm excited about it. artists in my family. Really? Anybody that can do that style? Uh, well, my sister's really good with animals. She's on, she's listening to the show right now. And then I have a grand nephew who does fantasy work. I would, I, I would want something that was like, well, the main character is a dwarf. So you'd have, we'd have to do a description of the dwarf. Uh, mm -hmm. and then something in the background that basically looks like a dead city underground. Yeah. Like the, like a, like a long, a long dead city. That's that's kind of what I'm wanting for the cover. I'm going to see if I can um, I can find something. I'll send it to you. In. Okay, no problem. I may have sent this to you before. I don't know, but give you an idea. I can show you all kinds of my sister's artwork. Nice. Mr. Jeff Yoda says, I was doing some research through some older newspapers and found that there was a skeleton of a giant human who they say was 12 feet, 7 inches tall down in Mexico in the 1880s. There's been a number of times that where there are accounts of giant skeletons being unearthed. Uh, and in fact, the U.S. Army, while making a runway on one of the Aleutian Islands during World War II, un unearthed uh, several uh, large skeletons. And a representative of the smithsonian came took possession of the bones and they were never heard from them again wasn't that amazing yeah i like that drawing that's really wicked yeah that is really good you know, my sister's more uh realistic she does more realism than i like that that's what i want that creepy kind of realism Cody Hamilton says, how big do you think the dog man population is worldwide? I'm sorry for spamming you with questions. I'm not a researcher, but I enjoy taking notes and asking questions. I'm addicted to the topic. You are not spamming me at all, dude. Ask as many questions as you want. And I, while I'm, I can't guarantee that I'm an expert on any given subject, I, I will give you the benefit of what I've read. Uh, so take that, take that with a grain of salt uh, and definitely you know, do, some, do some of your own research on the subject. But uh, I think the raw world population of dog men probably isn't huge uh, because if there were a bunch of them, they would have lost their fear of us a long time ago. Uh, I think they're still fairly sl small in numbers, which gives them pause about attacking humans in large, in large groups, uh, which is why you generally only hear of people going missing in, in small groups. What you generally, when they're hiking alone or camping alone, that's generally when your appearance, your disappearances happen. Uh, so they've still got a reason to fear us. Uh, because they know in large numbers, humans will still put them down. Um, and I don't care what kind of, what kind of, you know, mysticism you might have about you or what kind of creature you are. You get enough people putting lead into you, you're going to drop. And at that point, when they put it down, even if it's still alive, they're going to find a way to kill it. And it's been my experience that removing the head of something kills pretty much everything. Yeah. So I think if they could get it down and cut its head off, I don't care what 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 mysticism or magic says. That I think I think uh, cutting its head off would do the damage. 
Uh, Bob Foote says, hey, DA, can you describe Valkyrie like the color of her hair? And just a description detail. I've just finished Blood Eagle. Interesting twist. I've always seen Val Valkyrie as a tall blonde uh, five, in the 5'10 to 6 foot range. Uh, she's not a small girl. Uh, and I, and and if you read uh, read Blood Eagle, you know, uh, Clark said she could have been a model. I've, I've seen her. I've seen her as very attractive, but not afraid to get her hands dirty. Uh, so just basically Valkyrie is the perfect description for her. She's a, she's a tall blonde that takes no crap off of anybody, specifically Margolin. <laughs> do you, are these dire wolves scattered or mostly in North America? Do you think I, I can't say for the rest of the world? I don't know for sure. Uh, but I think they would, if, if, if there are relic populations of dire wolf slash dog men, and if, and if that is the true origin, then they're going to follow the, the, their most likely prey. I would say they're very opp opportunistic and humans only taken when, when they need, when, when the opportunity arises or when they can't get the regular prey. But like in the old case in the LBL, like, uh, like Naoma was talking about, some of those bison calves go missing all the time. Same thing with the elk herds. And there are elk and bison both in LBL. Uh, I would say if they're around, they're where they would follow the migrating migrating herds. They'd follow the moose. They'd follow the elk. They'd follow the caribou. Um, that's why you get these sightings in such remote, rugged areas. Uh, but there are still a number of places like LBL and the big thicket of Texas and places like down in Louisiana where there are deep swamps and deep woods. Hell, here, even here in Missouri, the Mark Twain National Forest is vast. And it would not shock me to go back in some of the deep parts of the Mark Twain and find somebody that's living in a cabin out there that nobody knew the, knew was out there uh, and had been living out there for two, three generations. It just wouldn't shock me. That's how deep the Mark Twain woods are. Hell, there are parts of Missouri I'm pretty sure nobody's ever set foot in. Uh, it's just deep sections of wilderness that nobody nobody's ever gotten into. And same in the Pacific Northwest and up in the Rocky Mountains. Hell, there are valleys and canyons in the Rocky, Man Rocky Mountains that no human's probably ever been in. Uh, and it's in these places like that that creatures, creatures like Bigfoot and Dogman would thrive because the game is plentiful. Uh, I mean, hell, there's accounts of Bigfoot a lot of accounts of Bigfoot throwing large rocks into water. Uh, that's actually a primitive fishing technique. You drive the fish toward a trap, and you know, fishing, uh, setting traps in in a in a in, in a stream is not hard to do. I mean, I could I could show you in some of the survival manuals I got, or you can just Google fish traps online. You know, like uh, primitive fish traps, and it would not be that difficult for a Bigfoot creature to set one of these up using rocks, and then you throw big rocks in the water to scare fish into the trap, and then you got easy pickings. Uh, very easy for these things to feed themselves. People take uh, don't take into account that an animal that big is going to need a considerable amount of protein, and it's going to be where the food's at. And to me, that tells me they're following the migrating herds. So I think their numbers are still fairly low unless you get into the deep parts of Canada where literally nobody is. Then I would say you'd probably run into a, a, a significantly higher percentage of population up that, up that way. But down here in the lower 48, you're gonna. You're only gonna find them in the really, really rugged parts of the country. Hmm. Uh, Wissa says Yoda, a DNA sample March fourth this year tested positive for Bigfoot genetic markers. That's interesting. Uh, Nisa says DA, give me a call and we'll get a mock up done. Awesome. Uh, you know, uh, I think I have your your contact information, but I'm sure I can get it. Uh, I just have to have to get with you and find out what it what a what you uh, what what, uh, what you uh, would charge for the covers? Because uh, at this moment, I'm still kind of having to stay on the on the on the lower side of, on, on costs. So if we could work something out, yeah, I would love to have a a beautiful cover. Marine says hi, Bob. Uh, Facebook user says uh, I'm get the wrong one. Facebook user says how big do dog men get here in the U.S.? I've heard accounts. Uh, from from the the six to seven foot range all the way up to the ten foot range, and that tends generally tends it tends to be about the biggest I've heard of dogmen. Uh, Bigfoot tend to tend to be bigger. Uh, however, I think pound for pound, if you put a big a Bigfoot up against a dogman, my money's going to be on the dogman because they're faster and they're, they're they're just more savage. They've got natural weapons and claws. Uh, but uh, if you 
if you really, really went toe to toe with something like a dog man versus a Gugway, I think Gugway is going to be wearing a new coat. Mm, I agree. Gugway are just freaking nasty. Yeah. Josh says, I think there's a joke, there's a joke on supernatural about that. Removing the head will always work when they're not quite sure what the law is, but lore is behind the creature. Yeah. It's, it's, a, you know, it's funny how many things that removing the head kills. And if it doesn't sure. kill it, now it's headless. Yeah. Sadly, though, you remove a head from a cockroach, it takes a few days. Yeah, it's still going to die, though. Not soon enough. No kidding. Well, that's when this a good squishing a always works. <laughs> yeah. My answer to cockroaches, squish them. Yeah. Uh, Cody says, question for both of you. What's your opinion on the correlation between Bigfoot and UFOs? Um... Do you want to take that one first? I'll chime in when you're done. I um, I am not an expert. Of course, nobody is. But I am the least of all experts who are not experts. Uh, and I tend to see Bigfoot as a as an unknown uh, great ape. That's how I see Bigfoot. Having said that, I know that there are a lot of accounts where people have seen Bigfoot and lights, Dogman and lights. There's there's a lot of correlation between the the seeing of the lights and the seeing of the UFOs and the uh, encounters with these things. But I don't know enough about it to know how truly connected they are so i think i answered that like a true politician yeah got of talked around it yeah. talk around the subject i i, I would agree with naoma that I, I i think my personal opinions lean toward physical creature uh now having said that i do believe in ufos i do believe that, and hell the, the the u.s government is now releasing footage saying this is a ufo or what are they calling them now uaws or something like that anyway um I think if they have, if the, if UFOs have traveled across interstellar, interstellar distances here to get here, they're studying us. And if they're here to study humanoid life form, why wouldn't they study all humanoid life form? So if you, know, you see a UFO at the, in, in near around the same time you saw a Bigfoot, it's very likely they were studying them just like they were studying us. I don't yeah. think they came to from space. Uh, and and I and I'm not I'm not knocking anybody that says this. Uh, I don't. Me personally, I don't believe they're from space or come through portals. I think that we're we're seeing something else that we're not able to explain, and that's what our mind's going to. Um, I don't think that they cloak. Uh, I had a buddy who was an army ranger, and uh, he uh, he him and I were out deer hunting one time, and uh, he said, "All right, I want to uh, because I was telling bullshit that camouflage doesn't work that good." I said, I'll be able to see you. He said, he was telling me he, he, he could sit out there and I could walk past him and never see him. I'm like, bullshit, it doesn't work that well. And he's like, Doug, I'm telling you, I, you when you know how to do it, you can disappear. He's like, and I, and I kept telling him bullshit. And uh, you know what he did? He goes, all right, watch me. And he took three steps into the trees and I lost him. <laughs> so, uh, Back to the Bigfoot and the UFOs, mm -hmm. I think that the question could be answered if they see one stepping off a UFO and it says, my butt hurts, that would say that they're studying the Bigfoot. Bigfoot got probe. <laughs> <laughs> they so promised gonna... candy. No candy, <laughs> just probe. I don't sparkle anymore. <laughs> Lexington says, given DM posture, they're even taller than they look. Yeah, they've been reported to walk with kind of a hunched posture. So I would say completely erect, they they probably appear taller. But some uh, some of the ones that I the accounts I've heard has been up to uh, up to around the ten foot range. So if I guess if they stood completely erect, that might put them in the eleven, maybe a little higher range. But they don't tend to walk that way. Uh, res to res. Reservoir Dog says, had 60 acres in Kirkland Lake, Ontario. There wasn't a deer hunting season till the mid-80s. Tons of barren moose. Just understanding the food source you mentioned. No need to answer, sir. Yeah, you, you, if there's food sources there, 
you're probably going to find large predators. And that's not just saying dogmen or Bigfoot. That's any, any large predators. When you get food sources like that, the predators will come. Alyssa says, Josh, a known chimpanzee to be specific for DNA markers. Uh, Reservoir says, uh, I live on the Niagara River. I see some weird stuff here. I bet you do. Um, Lexington says, lights, st- lights, possible stealth helicopters. Maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the government does keep tabs on these creatures. And in fact, I'm, firm, I'm firmly convinced that's why the National Park Service was created, to create sanctuaries for these creatures. And that's why at certain times of the year they say, oh, no, the park is closed for maintenance or you, you can't hike these trails because they know when these creatures are most active. Uh, I think Teddy Roosevelt was a firm believer in cryptids, and I think that's why the National Park Service was founded. That's my opinion, but th- that's a, that's an argument we can make at another time. I can do another whole show on that. That's uh, one I had never thought of until you brought it up, but ever since you mentioned it to me, I'm kind of in agreement with you on it that. It just one. makes a huge amount of sense. Yeah. Especially when, also, you, when you capital that with uh, the missing 411 maps, that these mm-hmm. clusters are around these national parks. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dresden says UFOs are not from, from quote unquote space. It very well could be our own our own government testing crap. We don't know about. Uh, go ahead, Naomi. What were you going to say? Uh, someone earlier, and I lost it. I was asking if you knew uh, David Polites, and the and I was just going to say that um, although I know about him, he was at the same uh, convention I was over the summer, and Cam Cameron Buck, Buckner got to actually because he went to the breakfast and all of that Mm -hmm. got to meet with him and talk to him. And he said, he's a really nice and interesting guy. I'd like to meet him. I would too. I'm a big fan of his work. I've read his books, watched his shows. Uh, And if if he's going to be on like uh, coast to coast, I will try to catch, always catch that show. Very fascinated with his work. I know he's an ex cop. I'd love to sit and have coffee with him and pick his brain. Cause I know there are stories he's not telling us. And because he, he always leaves the stories, he presents the information, lets you draw your own conclusions. And that's the brilliant part about missing 411, because he doesn't say what he thinks it is. He wants you to think, decide what you think it is. And I, and I agree with that approach, because if he, you know, it's like that guy on ancient aliens, everything's aliens, you know, um, mm-hmm. and it, it, you do that enough, you lose credibility. Even if you're right, you lose credibility. So Pilates doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. He, he, he presents everything. And let you go, well, okay, if it can't be this, and it can't be this, and it can't be this, what the hell could it be? And and it pre- I find that true marketing genius. God, mm-hmm. that's intelligent. That's yeah. genius. I would love to be able to, to get Pilates on the show, but I don't think he's going to respond to a rinky-dink outfit like mine. Uh, I, I've, I've, uh, I, I've already messaged him. I'm not holding my breath. I don't think he'll get back to me. Uh, but I have been shocked before. I mean, we, I, I messaged Jonathan Mayberry to have him come on the show and he's like, yeah, yeah. When do you want me on? So yeah. it can happen. <laughs> I, I, I'm not expecting him to get back to me, but if he does, we will be making a huge deal out of having Dave and Pilates on the show. I can tell you that. Oh, <laughs> definitely. Uh, what's this says taken with EDNA kits from underneath a wood structure. Okay. Uh, I think that's what conversation with Josh, uh, Oh, okay. Josh is talking about Dresden's comment about them not being from space. Um, Josh says, I'd love to know about their burial rites. I imagine it's fascinating. Well, we know we know primitive man, Neanderthal man, had intricate burial rites. Uh, they know that from some of the caves they found throughout Europe. Uh, and hell, we're even finding sites like that here in the States. Uh, primitive man was may, may not have been as primitive as we thought they were. Yeah, definitely. Um. I'd kind of like to know their burial rites too, because obviously they have them. I agree. They do burials. RJ says silent lights hovering over major battlefields. I've seen on three continents over over thirty five years. What are they? Valkyrie, angels, us from another time. Could be any of the above. Could be hell. It could just simply be you know, you know the the spirits of those who fell there checking checking up on the place. Mm-hmm. I mean battlefields. Battlefields are always going to be steeped in lore. Uh, it's there. It's there. It's not just. It's not just because the battle was fought there. It's it's a place of 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 deep sorrow, and that kind of sorrow stains a place. 
when when that much blood is shed on a site. Hell, there's there are two battlefields within short driving distance of where I'm sitting right now. Uh, the Battle of Wilson's Creek was fought just outside of Springfield near the town of Battlefield, Missouri, and it was a bloody battle. Uh, and there are people there are all kinds of stories coming out of there. People there at dusk seeing ghosts. Then we've got the battle that, that fought was fought down near Carthage, a battle so bad it was referred to as the Battle of Hell Hole. That kind of carnage stains a place. And it's not just a hallowed ground at that point anymore. It's a place of deep, deep sorrow where people died violently and suddenly. And that very that very thing will stay in a place forever. And I think that's why you see lights over it. It's not necessarily not necessarily, you know, aliens or Valkyrie or angels or anything like that. It's possibly souls that just have not accepted the fact that they were died in an instant. They're still there. But that's again just my opinion. Uh sticking with that topic and going clear off of what we were set to talk about tonight. I uh just did a, a story about green ice down at Chickamauga um, mm-hmm. battlefield on the tenant wells down by uh, Chattanooga. And um, of course, green eyes is some kind of a being that's been seen there since, and in the native Americans actually say long before uh, the battle, but um, the, the, um, Interesting, the thing that I found out about that, and this is going way off topic, is what Chickamauga means in the Cherokee language. What does it mean? River of Death. River of Death. Huh. It was named before that battle ever took place. wonder <laughs> why. When you get places like that, and you can look at maps from all over the country, you look at some of the older maps and you'll find locations like Devil's Creek and the River of Death and, you know, Hell's Kitchen, and there, there's one up by uh, a Haha Tonka State Park called the Devil's Kitchen. Then uh, they're just they're all over the place, and it, may, it really makes you wonder why these places got names like this. Uh, Josh, like, what was that word again? Josh told me the word for it, and I can't remember it again. Anyway, go on. But uh, places like that, they're named like that for a reason, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, I would love to know the reasons behind it. Um, uh, specifically, like there's a place called Devil Springs. I mean, and, and I've been there, and it's uh, it's a it's a natural spring flowing out of the out of a cliff face. And we've checked the water before; the water's clear. I've drank from it. It's actually a pretty a pretty beautiful place, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Why the hell would you call it Devil Springs? <laughs> because it, w- the impression I got there was not just relaxing, but the water was clear and they had a, had a basin set up made, uh, made out of stone uh, where it pooled up and the water was as cold as could be because it's spring water. Uh, but I've refilled my canteens out of that, out of that spring a dozen times or more with, without any, without any bad effects. So what about that place made them name it Devil Springs? Uh, could it be safe? <laughs> It could possibly be. <laughs> yeah, it, it is interesting. There, there's a whole science to that, the meaning behind the naming of places. And I am always amazed to find the um, the negative names to Native American names <laughs> that we've given places because they called it that and thought, oh, that's a cool name. <laughs> and find out, oh, that means river of death. <laughs> So, yeah, Um, but there's a word for it. Josh told me the last time we discussed this and I, my mind is old and full of cobwebs and I can't remember it anymore. So Patty says, whoa, river of death. Yeah. Yeah, And it's actually not even a river. It's a Creek. (laughs) But Mrs. Chef Yoda um, says we have a place nearby called devil's bathtub. Wonder if somebody saw him taking a bath. There you go. Yeah, maybe that would be wild. <laughs> I can't see Satan taking baths. I don't know. RJ says, uh, Devil Springs, something scared someone out there. Devil's Golf Course, Devil's Condo. <laughs> yeah, the we had <clears throat> in my hotel hometown, <clears throat> there's a place called Devil's Glen, and there's a road, Devil's Glen Road. 
And I've always wondered, you know, wow, why would people want to build on that road? But they do. Oh, I'm starting to feel the effects of day after day after day of recording. My throat is starting to really get to me. Well, we are rapidly approaching the three hour mark, which usually get, finds us both getting tired. Yeah. Um, why don't we take a quick break and we'll, uh, we'll play the commercial from uh, Carrie from Dark Angel Medical. And uh, if you want to get up and stretch your legs and get a drink, I'll, I'll hold the fort for a few minutes and I'll do, I'll do likewise. And then, uh, then we'll either continue or decide what we're going to do from there. Sound good? Sounds good to me. I'll be back shortly. Okay. Well, folks, I wanted to uh, say a quick word about Carrie Davis and Dark Angel Medical. Uh, they're our, our, our unofficial official sponsor for the DAX Machina podcast. Uh, I, I spent most of my adult life in, a, in, in one la- one capacity or another in law enforcement. And I, I've used a lot of medical kits over the years. But the best I've ever used are the Dark Angel Medical Kits. They've got kits for everything from basic first aid kits, what they, which they call the ouch pouch, all the way up through the dark kits, which stands for direct action trauma kits. And uh, those those kits are, are fantastic. And I would not trust another kit to save my life. Whether you're planning on going camping, hunting, fishing, bike riding, backpacking, uh, any normal activity that you're going to do, especially involving the outdoors and remote places, you want a medical kit with you. And if you plan on doing any field research as as any type of cryptozoologist or exploring cryptids, definitely take a, take a med kit. Two things you should always have with you in the woods and the ability to defend yourself, even if that's just bear spray. And the ability to take care of yourself if you should become wounded, because becoming incapacitated from a wound in the woods is a great way to be dinner for something. Uh, so if you're going to do anything in the woods, or you're going to do anything, you know, like if you you shoot you do shooting as a sport, or anything, hell, even driving to work. I mean, you might need a kit. You might come up on an accident, or God forbid, you're in one. Yeah, you never know what when you're going to need one of these kits. Uh, it's better to ba- better to have one and, and not uh, have one and not need it than need one and not have it, because it's much like a parachute in that situation. If you ever need one and don't have it, you'll probably never need, need one again. Uh, so, quick word from Carrie over to, at uh, uh, Dark Angel Medical. Hey everybody, this is Carrie Pocket Doc Davis from Dark Angel Medical, and you are listening to D A X Machina with D A Roberts. You may recognize me or some of my products from Dark Angel Medical in some of the Apex Predator, Lakeview Man, and Wild Hunt books. And you can get those products at www.darkangelmedical.com along with training classes on how to use those products and save a life. Shoot us an email at info at darkangelmedical.com and be the difference. And that's Dark Angel Medical, folks best med kits in the business and they have what's called a kit for life guarantee. If you use your kit to save a life, even if it's your own, you document the event, send your kit back to Dark Angel, Dark Angel and they will re-equip the kit for free for life. Because they they keep track on the number of lives that have been saved using their kits and it's over 200 now. Uh, and that's something Carrie's very proud of. Carrie's a hell of a good guy, he's a, a military veteran. Was, was in the Air Force uh, was a, as a combat medic and was seconded to, to Army Special Forces units, been all over the world doing that kind of thing. And when he got out, he, he founded Dark Angel Medical, and they are the best kits in the book. So definitely check those out. Uh, RJ says, I know dark, dark kits uh, to people, and they say they can't afford it. I think you cannot, cannot afford to not have one. Is your life worth another worth 190 bucks? Is your spouse or child not worth a couple hundred bucks? Absolutely right. And if you use it to save a life, you know, you, they, they refill it for free. You know, it, it, it's one of those things that, you know, it, it, there's no amount of money in the world can replace that life that could be lost. And med kits are, if you're, you're going, if you're doing anything, if you're hunting, fishing, camping, backpacking, if you're doing anything where you're going to be away from immediate service, like 911, take a med kit. And even out on the road driving, you never know when one might come in handy. And the life you save could very well be the, be your own or somebody you care about. Uh, Josh says, I don't understand why people would hold back important information on a topic where community is craving the proof for understanding. I, I totally agree. You know, cryptids are one of those things that I just don't understand why, why the government doesn't admit that they're there. But it would also at the same time put entire industries in a tailspin when people wanted one of these, wanted protections for these same creatures. 
Josh, says, you, you have your reasons, I'm sure, but it seems counterintuitive. Uh, Rise of War Dogs is Devil's Hole, not Devil's Den, Civil War. I meant War of 1812. Uh, <laughs> DA, where do you do late night cashew chicken runs? Well, thanks to the the world we live in because of the, uh, the, the Black Plague of the 21st century, I won't call it by name because that gets you kind of roughed up by the uh, the uh, censors on YouTube. Uh, but the Black Plague of the 21st century has kind of ruined late night runs for anything. So at this time of night, you got pretty much two choices. You got Domino's Pizza or the overnight McDonald's, neither of which are that appealing. So probably when the show goes off, I'm just going to go in and cook something. <laughs> Sorry, I had to make sure my microphone was on. <clears throat> okay, so. The beer Marshall bug. Well. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Miller says, killer show tonight. I cleaned my entire room and just listened to the show and had deep thoughts about Dogman for three hours. Do you think Dogmen have the ability to love later, DA? I think most animals. Uh, more so than we realize, have the have the capacity for emotional attachments. Uh, I mean, if anybody thinks an animal can't love you, they've never owned a dog. Um, dogs love you unconditionally, and they're a member of the canine species. So I don't think, you know, I mean, look at the the amount of affection that an entire pack of wolves takes when raising the, the raising the, the pups. Uh, it's the entire pack gets involved. Uh, you know, the animals have a capacity for love. And I, th I think even creatures like, like Bigfoot or Dogmen do to the extent, well, they, they do to their own extent. I'm not saying that, that it's like a minuscule ascent, ascent, extent or anything like that. I'm saying to their own extent. And it's generally probably kept reserved for their own, their own, their own kind, their own offspring, their own pack. And that's the same with wolves. Uh, it's only when animals form attachments to humans when they have that, that, uh, that, that emotional response. And I've been uh, pretty fortunate to have that, uh, that kind of bond with, with several dogs in my lifetime that dogs I know would have died for me. And I, them, I mean, uh, you know, dogs become members of your family. They become, they become like one of your kids. I mean, I know, um, when my, uh, my, my bull mastiff Coda, uh, he got bone cancer. And uh, it got got into his right shoulder really bad, and he couldn't use his front paw. And uh, they, we, I got him to the vet. Of course, we didn't know anything about it. The dog never complained or whined. He just started or started limping one day. And, uh, and I thought, well, maybe he stepped on something. I checked his paw and didn't see anything. Well, a week goes by and he's still limping. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to take take him to the vet. I've got to know what's wrong with him. And. Uh, I took him to the vet and they did some tests and they said he had, he had bone cancer and it was bad. And uh, she told me that, uh, that she, uh, she could put him through chemotherapy and they would have to amputate his, his leg. And, but she said, considering the advanced state of the cancer, um, he was only going to live probably another three more months at that. And in that he was going to, he was going to be sick constantly and he was going to be in constant pain. And I, I couldn't do that to him. And she said, the best best thing to do if you've got the heart to do it is to go ahead and put him down. And uh, I, I, they had a great big, because he's a big dog. He's 100, 150 pounds. And they had a great big shelter that they had him in. And I crawled in that shelter with him. And I, I held his head in my lap while they put him to sleep. And I cried like a two-year-old. And hell, I'm tearing up now thinking about that big goofy dog. And uh, Xander passed more suddenly. He passed at home. And um, we we buried him in the backyard, and uh, I still go out, sit by his grave sometime. And uh, for about the first six months after Xander passed, my dog Harley that we have now, uh, I'd let him out in the backyard, and he would go out there, and he would just vanish. And I'd call him, and he wouldn't come, and he wouldn't come. So I'd finally go out and look for him, and he'd be laying next to Xander's grave. He'd just be laying there, he wouldn't get up. Um. And he still does it from time to time. He just doesn't do it as often as he used to. But don't don't tell me dogs can't love, because I've seen it and I felt it. And uh, you know, I I always hope I have a dog in my life because you know life is so much better with a dog. Sorry. I can I can tell you a dog story that'll make you smile. Okay. When the Beatles were in Florida, they stayed at a hotel, and George Harrison liked to talk about the lady who 
stayed there the same time that they did. She had a dog with no legs and every day she took it out for a slide. That's so bad. <laughs> I know, but that's George Harrison. <laughs> Anyway, you know, I think about the, the grief that elephants show when they come across uh, the bones of another elephant that they may mm -hmm. not even have known. Yeah. Animals certainly have capacity for emotion beyond what we're willing to credit them. I, I agree. Uh, Jonathan Newell says, thank you for your thoughtful answer and good night to your lovely co-host. I'll be at Braycon next week and I'll send you something cool. Sorry about your pup, bro. You will meet again. I, I totally believe that. I, I think he came to say goodbye to me a few weeks after that because he would, when my, I worked overnights a lot of, in law enforcement, but on the nights I would home, I was home. He would never bother my wife in the middle of the night to let him out. He just let her sleep. He would lay next to the bed by her. But on the nights I would home, that big turd would come to my side of the bed and he was just tall enough where he could walk up and just put his chin on the bed <laughs> and without leaning up, not jumping up. He was standing flat footed and he'd put his chin on the bed and he'd put his nose right in front of my face and he'd go <sighs> <sighs> until I woke up and let him outside. And uh, for the first few weeks after he was gone, I would, I would wake up to, to that, that smell and that feeling of him, him chuffing in my face and he wasn't there. So I, I, I believe he came to check on me. I had a cat for years who used to stand on my chest and fart every morning. <laughs> I'm not being silly. It really <laughs> did. And he was a Siamese cat and he had a crook in the end of his tail as many Siamese cats do. And he would walk back and forth in front of the couch. So I'd pick him up by the base of his tail and let him walk on his front legs. One day I was saying, I know, I know. I was there. I said, I got the coolest cat in the world. He lets me do this. He seems to enjoy it. Who knew? And my son looked at me and says, Mom, he thinks he's got the coolest owner in the world. You let him fart in your face every day and you don't <laughs> say a thing. I was like, yeah, that's probably true. But he did. He climbed up on my chest every day. Gas, gas. It's time to get up. I miss that cat. Gas, yeah. gas, but I do miss that <laughs> Xander, my, my English Mastiff. He would come into the, the, the living room and he'd flop down and lay in front of everybody. And it sounded like a tire going flat. He would hit the ground and you'd hear. And then a few seconds later, your eyes would start to burn. You'd be like, oh, oh God. <laughs> and and then your wife and, would be like, oh, yeah, blame the dog. And yeah. you're like, no, oh, really? <laughs> oh, she knew it was the dog because his were the worst. And I'd look down at him and he'd raise his head up and go <laughs> lay back down. Like, that's what you get. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Lexington, this is funny. Uh, anyway. Uh, Lexington says you'll see them again. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Reservoir says you're a good man, DA. Well, thank you. I try to be. I don't always succeed, but I do try. Uh, John says, Miller says, I love your answer. Thank you. Processed dog food might have been, uh, but Xander Xander was one of those dogs that never met a meal he didn't like, um, and we uh, we would give him uh, like uh, deer meat. We would supplement his his food with with deer meat uh, because we wanted him to have good protein because he was a big dog. In his prime, Xander, our English Mastiff, probably weighed a buck eighty. I mean, hundred eighty pound dog maybe as much as 200 because the vet could never get an accurate weight of him. She'd have to put weigh his front half and then weigh his back half because she didn't have a scale big enough for that dog. And his paws were like this big around. I mean, that dog was freaking massive. And, uh, he was, he was just a big goofball. He, uh, that dog could pop basketballs. We used to give him basketballs to play with in the backyard and he'd get tired of playing with them and pop them. Wow. Just pick them up. And <laughs> I've seen him do it more than once. It was funny because the, when the air would rush out, his jaws would go. <laughs> I remember going to the vet's office one time and there was a lady there with a Mastiff. And I remember that he was sitting in the chair with his front paws. It was weird the way he was sitting. He was not like sitting up in the chair, but he had his 
butt on the chair and his front paws down. And I remember thinking that was the biggest dog I'd ever seen. And I also remember the way he was looking at my little dachshund like it was a meal. <laughs> I thought, dog, you are in trouble because there's no way I'm going to stop that thing from eating you if it gets hungry. Xander, when he started getting older, we never <laughs> let him get on the furniture because he was so big. Yeah. Uh, but we would come back from somewhere and we'd catch him on the couch. And uh, the first few times we caught him, he would jump down and act like he wasn't up there. We'd be like, well, what are you talking about? And then he got to where he'd just look up like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> <Just like that. laughs> Did you my wife's like, to eat? <laughs> my wife's like, well, guess that's his couch now. Because he took up the whole couch, three cushion couch. Thanks, Rez. I appreciate that. Lexington says that dog's fart should have fallen under the Geneva Convention bans. <laughs> I think they did. Yeah, that's a, that's my friend Greg. He was used to come over to the house. That dog could clear a room. Oh my god! <laughs> One time, I when I was working overnights in the sheriff's department, I boiled like like an eighteen pack of of eggs, hard boiled eggs, because I was going to make egg salad the next night when I got home from work. Uh, so I peeled all these hard boiled eggs, put them in a bowl. You put them in the fridge and uh, I come home and I go to make the salad and I open the refrigerator and the eggs are gone. I'm like, honey, where's all those hard boiled eggs? She's like, I don't know. They were in there just a little bit ago. So I, I'm like, well, where the hell did they go? Uh, so I knew they weren't downstairs anywhere. So I go upstairs to check on the boys and my youngest son, love that little turd to death. He loves hard boiled eggs. He was probably all of eight. He was sitting in the floor in his bedroom with the TV on watching cartoons. And he had that bowl in his lap <laughs> and one of the mastiffs laying on each side. And he put salt on an egg and eat it. And he'd give each of the dogs an egg. And, he'd oh, give... and there was like three eggs left when I got there. I'm like, oh, no. oh my God. And if you've never smelled hard boiled egg, egg farts from a mastiff, Oh, dear Lord. They almost rendered the entire house uninhabitable for about a week. Make them sleep in the kids' room. I, thought, I did. I thought, I thought we were going to have to repaint when we were done. Oh, my God. Whew. Oh, that's pretty funny. Oh, anyway. <sighs> I'm getting a little bit tired. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we're both getting there, kind of wind, winding down. I ran out of coffee about an hour ago, and uh, yeah, only I only got so much Gatorade left. I went to refill my cup, and I got about that much. <laughs> that much, sorry. <laughs> oh, well. Facebook user says, matches, matches are a requirement. We were afraid to light matches. We thought we'd explode <laughs> the house. Just yeah. the windows go poof, all over the house. Do a little too much methane in that gas. Yeah, and just trouble. <laughs> just a little bit, and and those mastiffs could do it. Oh my God, great great dogs. They were the best. But don't don't ever ever let them have hard boiled eggs. You. Oh. Yeah. I I made a joke about that in one of the Ragnarok Rising books uh, about when uh, the character Gunny was given beans to to one of the dogs in the book. Oh, yeah, I made a joke about that, but that was really based on that event when Noah feeding hard-boiled eggs to the dogs. <laughs> oh, it was bad. Yeah. That's not something I would normally feed a dog. No. I say I hear eggs are good for them. I've been told many times if you crack a raw egg into their food, that it's good for their <laughs> coat and it's good and healthy for them. But don't give them hard-boiled ones. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Lanita says, me too. I'll see you guys this weekend. Love you both. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We love you guys. Uh, Reservoir says, you guys made my day. Thanks, Naomi and DA. I'm calling tonight. I'll see you guys Saturday, God willing. Well, hopefully we'll so we see you there. Folks, it has been an, been an awesome show. We've talked about a lot of the Dogmen accounts that you don't get to hear about, that, that don't make the the top. When you look up Beast of LBL, they're not the top ones that come up. We talked about a lot of the lesser, uh, the lesser encounters. And there are, all, there are tons of them out there that we didn't even talk about. Um, there's all kinds of animal attacks, people gone missing in the LBL area, even outside of LBL. Uh, they're seeing bipedal dog-like, wolf-like creatures 
all over the place and not just limited to LBL, not just limited to the beast of Bray Road. If you put look look up dogman sightings in the United States, you're going to find a lot. Uh, in fact, right now, there's been a lot of them up in Maine, uh, which is something I'm going to do a little more research into. My son and I were just talking about that yesterday. Uh, but, you know, we, we've only scratched the surface with this. And we're going to delve a little bit deeper. We're going to get to talk about uh, dogmen in uh, England this weekend on the Saturday show. Um, it's going to be it's going to be a good time. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, if you guys aren't familiar um, with with uh, Leon Howarth, check out his channel. It's um, it's called uh, I think it's called Do It Knowles Way. I, I'd have to let me check the, uh, the listing there. Yeah, it's uh, Do It Knowles Way, youtube.com slash C slash Do It Knowles Way. Not sure why it's named that, but that's the name of his YouTube channel. Uh, let me uh, post the link on that so you guys can check out a few of his podcasts and shows before he's actually on. I'll post that there. Um, but it's he's got a good, he's got a good channel, and there's some really interesting information there. And I didn't know that there were so many sightings of, of dogman-type creatures in England. Uh, but him and I have been been talking off and on quite a bit, and uh, just some of the stuff he told me and the way we, to- we, we things that we talked about, I thought he'd be a great guest. So I think we're going to have a great time having him on the show, um, and we're we're going to delve into not only you know the uh, the accounts of in, in England and in Europe, but we're going to compare and contrast them with some of the stories here. So that should give you a much better idea that if we're seeing the same thing on two continents, that there's more to it than than people think. Um, Naoma, you are awesome. You crack me up. You you, you get me back on ta- on target sometimes. And uh, we're by and large, we've lately the last you know last quite a few shows we've been managed to stay mostly on topic, uh, but we do have a good time, and that's that's the wonderful part about about doing this show is we get to laugh and we talk to everybody in the chat room and we just have a good old time. And to me, it's like like just hanging out with friends, and that's why I enjoy doing this so much. Uh, just get to hang out and talk and talk about cryptids. As my wife gets bored of me talking about cryptids, so eventually <laughs> I got to talk about other stuff. Well, and, uh, to, to paraphrase the Cheshire Cat, we're all awesome here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Facebook user says Vic Cundiff has a very good Dogman channel uh, called Dogman Encounters. Yeah, I've listened to some of his shows. Um, some pretty good information there. Um, but uh, you know, the Patreon po- a bot just popped in. If you, if you guys, if you guys haven't checked out the Patreon, I hope you guys give it a you give it a shot. Check it out. I mean, there's a lot going on there with there too, helping to shape the books and and helping decide titles and covers. And you can even be a character in a book depending on what tier you're at, um, or even choose the book you're a character in. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that that you can do to get involved with the DA universe and help promote you know, promote shows like this and help us to keep doing this. Uh, so. Uh, Dresden says, Pilates will come on if you request it formally, brother. God bless you and your team. Thank you. I sent a request to Pilates and he hasn't gotten back to me. I hope he does. I would love to have him on the show. Um, yeah, Pilates would be a fantastic guest. I'm going to try to get Ron Moorhead back on the show uh, to discuss the Sierra sounds. Uh, last week we had uh, MK Davis, which was a great show. Uh, MK is a wealth of information. Uh David, Mr. Chef Yoda says David Pilates does have a YouTube channel called Missing 411. It is a great show. I'm I subscribed to that channel. I listen to a lot of his stuff. Every time he puts a new one out, I've got to check that out. And also, while you're checking stuff out, let me uh, get back over here. But uh, you know, make sure you go over and check out the Dixie Cryptid podcast. And uh, that's youtube.com slash C slash Dixie Cryptid or the What If It's True podcast.com. And that's where you'll get to hear awesome stories narrated by our own Naoma Cam- Na- Naoma Finn and Cameron Buckner. I almost called you Naoma Cameron. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say Naomi Campbell. And I've been like, okay. I'll that might that. have been where I was going. I don't know. I, I could 50 50, one way or the other. I don't know what you, half the time. I don't know what's going to come out of my own mouth. Uh, but, but check those channels out, like and subscribe. Uh, they get some great stories over there. And I've been pretty privileged that they've, they've this, I thought a couple of mine were good enough to do. So they've done some of my sto- stories. And, and hell, even I like to go back and listen to Naoma narrate my, my stories because it's it's hard to remember I wrote them when she's narr- when she's narrating them because they're they're like brand new and alive to me. They um, are fantastic stories. I love doing every minute of them. You're <laughs> you really are a great writer. And anybody out there who hasn't picked up at least one of his books, you're missing out on a lot. You really are. Great stories, great books. 
you know what we haven't done in a few episodes? What have we not done in a few episodes? We haven't given away a $5 gift card. Oh my goodness. We need to do that. I think we should do that before we sign off. Yes. While we've still got quite a few people in the chat room. How about... Oh, and this is... Uh, sorry, it's called the Missing Form 1. It's called the Can-Am Missing Project. True. I, I, I remember that. How about we do a trivia question? Okie dokie. That'll be from this show tonight. Let me think. The first person that can come up with the correct answer to this will get a $5 gift card to Amazon. And coincidentally, my uh, my the the Kindle editions of all my books are priced at $4.99. So you, know, you, could, you could check out one of my books basically for free. Earlier, Naoma talked about a creature called Green Eyes. Where was it at? Ooh. Anybody? <laughs> Careful, we might get a copyright strike. Oh yeah, I don't want that to happen. <laughs> Ooh, very close. Somebody very close. got the American name Ms. for it. Or the Ms. English Chief name. says Ireland, but <laughs> we got a couple of river deaths, but that's not it. We want the, the 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 name. There was a battle there. Yes, a very famous one. Second bloodiest battle of the Civil War. Anybody? 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 Bueller? Bueller? Bueller. Have him to do the river again, give it to him for the river of death, but that's really not it. No. Oh, yeah, we got there it. it. There we got it. <laughs> that would be RJ. <coughs> All right. There you go. All right. I will send you the Facebook code, the, uh, the code for that. I'll text it to you, man. Uh, so, uh, be watching for that here in the next few minutes. I'll just text that to you and you can get you a, a, a Kindle edition of a book or whatever you choose to spend it on. It's a $5 Amazon gift card. So I'll get that sent out here in just a few minutes. Uh, Josh says, I think your problem tonight, DA, if you had not enough alcohol, that's why you keep tripping over your words. I'm not drinking <laughs> tonight. I'm, I probably should have made myself a, uh, a couple of old fashions before the night. Facebook user <laughs> says, what was the answer? Chickamauga. The Battle of Chickamauga is where Green Eyes, around the Chickamauga battlefield is where Green Eyes is seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like I said, RJ, I will be sending that to you here shortly. Uh, give me a few minutes and I will text that over to you. So uh, that's uh, the, that'll do it for tonight, folks. I want to thank you guys for sticking with us, hanging out with us for three hours. It's been awesome. Naoma, you are awesome as always. So are you. And uh, remember, if you guys had an encounter, or you'd just like to talk to talk to us about something, have a question, uh, or have anything you would like us to discuss on the show, or even possibility of shows you would like to see us do, contact us through my email there. It's daroberts at daroberts.net. And uh, we, if you wish to remain anonymous, that can happen too. Or if you have an account you'd like to be like to have read on either the What If It's True or Dixie Cryptid po podcast, you can contact them through their through their YouTube channels, and you just might have one of your show one of your your uh, stories narrated on the air. Uh, so I want to thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Uh, you guys are absolutely awesome, and uh, appreciate everything you guys do. It's been an awesome awesome night. We had a lot of a lot of activity in the chat room, and you guys were fantastic. So hope you guys have a great night, and uh, take a quick second to say thank you to all the men and women in uniform, and I keep I hope you uh, keeping us safe out there, and hope you all are safe, and and we want you guys to know we appreciate everything you do to keep us safe. So good night, everybody, and uh, I hope you guys have an amazing night, and we will see you on Saturday. Good night. Thank you for joining us tonight on DAX Machina. If you ever have an encounter of your own that you wish to discuss, contact us at daroberts at daroberts.net. You can remain completely anonymous if you wish. 
pull your covers up tight and keep a nightlight burning bright. Oh, and did you forget to lock your doors? <laughs> <laughs>